his dust. Suckers! You know what? Let me just take a quick sip of my magical podcasting serum. Oh, that's going to work out just nice, boys. Just nice. Welcome, everybody, to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club, episode 165. Does that sound right? 165. That is correct. 165. 165. Uh, everybody doing okay? It's been, a, it's been a minute since I've seen you, boys. Oh, I'm, I'm doing good. I just cracked a whiff of this, and it is like citrusy, hoppy. I mean... I'm I'm interested. Uh, my beer smells very well. I've noticed the aroma of my beer as well. I I think we're. I think we, it's a good sign. We're in for a good show. Um, you know, boys. Every once in a while, I stumble across a news article that leaves me shaking my head. Actually, that happens quite often these days. If I'm being honest, I think probably the same with you guys. And very. this uh, this week, I saw something that I felt compelled to share with you guys and get your take on. Have you guys ever heard of Flacco the Owl? No. No. Um, the doctor looks like he might have heard of Flacco the Owl. I think what? I saw it on like a Saturday Night Live skit recently. Is he related to Joe Flacco that was the quarterback? No, one, <laughs> one C. One C. Oh, no, then I don't know Flacco the Owl. All right. Well, it was big news last week. Uh, you might have seen it on Saturday Night Live on the news. On the Maybe they did a skit about it. Uh, yeah. He, it was big news in New York City. Uh, Flacco was a rare Eurasian eagle owl who lived in the Central Park Zoo until he was reported missing from his exhibit last February 2023. It was later revealed that vandals had cut out, uh, had cut Flacco's stainless steel mesh cage and set the owl free into the skies of New York City. Against all odds, Flacco survived on his own, despite fears that his plush life at the zoo. You know, he had fed and tended to by the zoo workers. Uh, They're worried about him. And they figured he was set up to fail out out in the wild. Uh, But that wasn't the case. And his inspiring life was cut tragically short February 23rd of this year. And here's a brief recap of the article I read published uh, March 26th. So uh, about a week ago. Here's the headline. Flacco the Owl's cause of death revealed beloved bird was suffering from pigeon herpes and had ingested rat poison before flying into glass building necropsy shows. Here's the, here's some uh, brief summation of the article. If Flacco the Owl had not died when he flew into an upper west side building, he would have been killed by pigeon herpes and rat poison that he had in his system from eating feral pests. A necro- necropsy report has revealed Flax- Flacco had captivated the hearts and minds of New Yorkers soaring over Central Park and hooting from the trees after vandals helped him escape captivity last year. Hundreds turned out for his funeral last month, gathering to weep at his favorite haunts after he was found lying dead in a courtyard on February 23rd. A month later, a autopsy report has finally revealed his cause of death to be Quote, traumatic injuries from flying into a building. Duh, no shit. But, but, but the report found he also had pigeon herpes and rat poison in his system that would have killed him soon, sooner or later. The report said these factors would have been debil- debilitating and ultimately fatal, even without a traumatic injury, and may have predisposed him to flying into or falling from the building. So the pigeon herpes might have actually caused him to to soar into the Upper West Side building. There was that. more writ- there was more written as far as the details of his life, but uh, who gives a shit? So I'm going to stop there. It's fucking Al. I think it's fair to say. Follow me on this. Flacco had a darkness within him uh, that few of his admirers were aware of. Sheesh. My main issue with all this is a simple one. This Flacco was a fucking celebrity. He was like the owl in New York City, on the west side at that. And he's banging pigeons? I don't think it was because he was banging pigeons. Come on, Flacco. Listen, Yax, come on, Flacco. If it was African parrot herpes or toucan herpes, hey, 
I wouldn't even be mentioning it. In fact, I might be filling up the Buddha remembrance tonight for poor old Flacco if that was the case. You know, God rest your nocturnal ass. But hey, you know what? I like the pigeon herpes. It means he's it. one of us. He's not out there fooling around with these high class birds, you know? He's just one of us. He's a regular bird. Fucking pigeon herpes. These shit machines, let me tell you something about pigeons. These shit machines are known for two things crapping on statues and delivering anonymous, disturbing letters to the doctor's ex girlfriends. Oops. Was I not supposed to say anything about that, doctor? I'm sorry. Well, I mean, technically, how, how would you know about it that they were anonymous unless you're the one who's using the pigeons to send the letters? I, I may have seen a, a mesh cage up on your rooftop. Uh, so anyway, hey, doctor, I think we can all agree that hopefully some of that nasty pigeon herpes rubbed off on those scandalous hussies. Am I right? I still I still have some questions about how you're aware of the pigeons carrying the letters. And does answer some questions. I'm sure that Flacco did not expect, nor did he want an autopsy to be done. It's a fucking bird. You know, he's laying there on the ground, taking his last few breaths and, you know, I had a good run. The important here, the important thing here is I'm a fucking bird who flew into a building happens every day. It's not like they're going to cut me open and perform a fucking autopsy or anything. I'm a fucking that's bird. Why, that's well, my thing. Can, can, it's like, why, why did you perform an autopsy? I mean, the bird hit a building. Thank God my legacy won't be tarnished by revealing my embarrassing pigeon herpes or my shameful rat poison addiction. They'll just put me in a shoebox, bury me a foot in Central Park, and that'll be that. End of story. Now, human beings, we just can't leave well enough alone. Well, we could it, it could have been murder. Murder has That's to right. be. And what are they going to do then? Call in the CSI boys to follow the clues? Start hanging around. Start hanging around the New York City Library, around the statues, asking the pigeons questions. Did you haven't seen the latest show on CBS, CSI Owl Investigations? Really could, man. It could. They, dude, you put that next to "So Help Me, Todd," and you've got two hours of TV. Well, look, I need you to. I need you three dudes to promise me something when I die an autopsy. When he promises now. When I die, an autopsy will not be performed. I was drunk as a skunk when I walked face first into that glass building. It had, you know what? I was drinking my usual four local, four loco sour apple martinis. Like I always do. End of story. Drunk ass died. Uh, and that's the only thing I had going on with me. The dude's BAC was through the roof, but he also had pigeon herpes. If I test positive in my autopsy for pigeon herpes, just know it's a conspiracy originated from other cigar media who are jealous of my good looks, my sharp wit. Case closed. <laughs> Frank? <laughs> it looks like this bird has flown the coop. <laughs> <laughs> Who? Because <laughs> 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 owls say who. Yeah, yeah, they do. Well, not Flacco. He doesn't say anything anymore. Thanks to the pigeon herpes. Damn pigeon herpes. Thought that was the rat poison. I like I like how quickly Yak Boy jumped in. You know, you don't have to necessarily have sex with a pigeon to get pigeon herpes. You sure you sure got on that real fast. I'm just saying, science. Science is never wrong. Uh, you how do you use the, you get it on the you using the public restrooms? Oh, the owl could have just used a dirty public restroom and gotten pigeon herpes. <laughs> Perhaps a, a dirty Ooh. needle. Hey, maybe he was shooting up that rat poison. I don't know. I think I think there's a lot to Flacco's life once he got free that we don't know about. And well, Frank, <laughs> sounds like a bird in the hand, two in the bush wasn't a euphemism this time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Sorry, I'm, they'll get better as the show goes on and I drink more. I uh, just cue up that saxophone in the background. You belong to concrete under your feet. Uh, okay. Well, that uh, I knew you guys would provide some invaluable insight into the story of Flacco. And uh, and no, I just want to make that very clear. He was no relation to Joe Flacco, the backup quarterback for the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> oh, is that where Flacco's at now? Yeah, he took him on a playoff run last year. Although they're the Browns, so they probably got rid of him. <laughs> we don't reward greatness around here. Let's go with the guy that we've overpaid and continuously gets hurt. <laughs> I got a feeling this season's going to be different. It's the Browns' way. It uh, is the Browns' way. Well, folks, uh, pigeon herpes aside, and I swear to God, if any of you say tonight's cigar has notes of pigeon herpes, yak boy, you seem to be real familiar. I was going to say, I, 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 I detected an aroma of rat poison. Well, I hope not too soon, because I only dipped it in a little rat poison. <laughs> and it's only in one of you or Tut's cigars, so tonight should be interesting. Uh, speaking of cigars, uh, that's what we do here, folks. Every episode, we pair a premium cigar with some premium craft beverages, hopefully, and we talk about a movie. So let's go ahead and introduce tonight's cigar. Now, uh, what you're going to see on the episode page on the TNCC website and Tud is holding up for you on the screen here, is not the official banding of the cigar. This is, uh, we were uh, provided these as a, excuse me, uh, Drew State does a event occasionally called Facebook Live, Freestyle Live, I'm sorry, on Facebook and YouTube, where they uh, ship out, You can, consumers can go buy these Freestyle Live packs. They usually include like a cigar stand, a lighter, travel case, and three or four mystery cigars. This cigar says FSL, Freestyle Live, March 2024. So last month, this cigar was a total mystery. And it was revealed by JD, Jonathan Drew, Willie Herrera, and the Drew Estate team on the last Freestyle Live that this mystery cigar, which, by the way, on the Drew Estate uh, fans group on uh, Facebook, I was the only one to guess correctly, I believe. Uh, yeah, everybody was saying this is a Connecticut Nica Rustica. Or some were saying it was a Connecticut Liga Pravada, nine Connecticut. Uh, but I reviewed... Nine Connecticut would be interesting. A few weeks ago, I reviewed the M81 Blackened Cigar from Drew State. You can check out that review on our website. And I just happened to later that night smoke one of these mystery cigars, and there was something a little something similar, a little some similarities there, which is weird because this is obviously a Connecticut lighter mm -hmm. shaped cigar, and that is an all Maduro blend of uh, dark, scary Maduro leaves. But there was a, a saltiness and a mustiness on the back end of the retro hail behind the pepper that boy, it just if I hadn't smoked them the same day, I probably would never have made the connection. But sure enough, what you're holding in your hand, boys, it well, Yak Boy and Tuttle, Doctor, I don't know what you're holding in your hand. Hey. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, is the S84 Shade to Black by Drew Estate, uh, which, of course, if you're a Metallica fan, is a riff on, hey, I use the word riff, um, is a riff on their classic song from 1984, Fade to Black. This is the Shade to Black. And S84 is, of course, 1984 is the year that the Ride the Lightning album came out. Uh, classics, Metallica's sophomore album after Kill 'em All, right before Master of Puppets. And I'm going to let the, the people that made the cigar tell you the rest about it. Um, following the resounding success of Drew Estate's partnership with Black and Whiskey on Black and Cigars M81 Maduro to the core. In 2022, Drew State announces the new Connecticut Shade Wrap brand release and shipping of blackened S84, Shade to Black. The cigars are a passion project between Rob Dietrich, the master distiller and blender of blackened whiskey, 
James Hetfield, Metallica co-founder, singer, and guitarist, and Jonathan Drew, founder and president of Drew Estate. Hetfield and Dietrich worked closely with Drew, a friend of Dietrich's for over a decade, to create the perfect blend for the cigar. The blackened S84 Shade to Black takes aficionados on a nuanced journey with its deliciously smooth and inviting blend. James Hetfield and Metallica shares this excite shares his excitement, stating, Shade to Black is more than just a cigar for us. It's a celebration of passion and a tribute to the craftsmen who strives for excellence in their lives. In other words, this cigar is for the real ones out there, not the filthy perverts like Flacco the Owl with his pigeon herpes having ass. Not for the pullers and tuggers. It is a 6 by 52 exactly, Tut, not for the pullers and tuggers. It is a 6 by 52 Toro, Connecticut, Ecuador wrapper. Now get this, the binder and the filler are the same as the, the M81. Uh, Connecticut River Valley Broadleaf Maduro binder, Nicaraguan Maduro and Pennsylvania Broadleaf Maduro filler. So really, I'm sure they tweaked the ratios a little bit maybe inside, but really... Uh, component wise, the only thing new is the wrapper. So it'll be interesting to see Tut. I know you've smoked a, a bunch of the blackens. It'll be interesting to get your thoughts. I'm really liking this. Uh, there is. And there's something across that palette that I'm just not able to identify. And it's sitting like right on, you know, those two glands that you have on the very edge of the tongue. Uh, it's sitting like right there, and it's it's tasty, and I just can't can't figure out what it is. I was not expecting this. Uh, I've I've been kind of like on an uber rustic Maduro kick lately. I mean, just like the filthier, the dirtier, the better. Um, and yeah, man, that that shade on there just brings out a, a neat little zang to it. It's God, what what the hell am I tasting? There's some earthiness. I mean, there's some earthiness and a little sweetness on the cold draw. Yeah, and you get that beautiful hay smell on uh, before that, lining that, it up. The hay, the hay on the on the wrapper is uh, undeniable for sure. But then, yeah, but really just some some sweetness, little earthiness on there, and then I'm gonna fire it up. Yak boy, have you lit up yet? I have. No, I'm very much the same way on the the cold draw. The the just the aroma on, on the wrapper all that all what you just said the hay just very light when i first lit up i mean just a you know it had a, a touch of you know the that's uh spice oh, right man, now, this, i'm just trying to get it oh this smells really good and it's got good aroma pouring off foot as i toast Things get it going. Let me. Oh, that is fucking interesting. Oh, that's a nice cracking white pepper through the nose. All right, I... This is gonna sound. This is gonna sound stupid, and it's gonna sound markety. And uh, I'm sorry yeah. for it sounding yeah. markety. Just don't say it then. Okay. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. All right. So you, you, you inhale or you, you take it in across the palate, you retro hell and you let it sit. There's an aftertaste there. And I'll be damned if my, if I, my taste buds aren't going, you know what? It's kind of reminiscent of chicken fried steak gravy. There's a bit of pepper that sits there on the tongue, but there's also a creaminess. And I, I don't one. I don't get cream ever, and I it just that's what my taste buds are telling me. I'm actually getting a Salisbury steak uh, gravy sensation through the back of the retro hill. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. It's not not chicken fried steak itself, just the gravy. I was thinking more au jus, but that's not nah, just the gravy. Just the gravy. Man, that is so badass. I, I I'm gonna say real quick. Right now, I, I was concentrating on the retro hill first here, and there is it, it's a much less uh, pepper kick than the M81 mm -hmm. Maduro. Uh, it's a it's a 
it's a very distinct spice, but it's 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 medium at best, and uh, it's nice. And then, man, I'm just getting some leather, leather really nice leather, and some cedar uh, come through the draw. No chicken fried steak gravy. I'll, yeah, I'll just I'm say all, this. I'm all on it. I'll just say this. Uh, when I found out that this was a new Metallica cigar from Drew Estate, I found myself, it's hard to get excited in the cigar world these days, uh, especially when you're battle weary guys who've been doing this shit as long as we have, you can slap a, a, a cool, a cool, you know, band on a cigar, come out with a cool box, but I just kind of had this moment where I'm like, you know, how cool is this? One of the bands that I idolized growing up and not, I, I'm not using that lightly. Like I had Metallica posters all over. Doctor can attest to this all. Oh, not just posters, rip pages out of rip magazine. Dude, on the in list. junior high, I would say Kate had a, a t-shirt. He could wear a different Metallica t-shirt every day for about two weeks when we were in junior high. And that's when shit wasn't easy. I had to send away for that shit. I had I had to cut out ads in in Circus Magazine and, <laughs> and, and send away for God. Who's that artist that did all the great Metallica stuff? Uh, it was like Nimrod or God. What was that guy's name? Or if Pinhead. they sold them, you had to go because they didn't have the store like this. Pusshead. Like, Sorry, temple, it was Pusshead. Temple Mall. You had to go to like the Austin or Colleen Mall to like a Gadzooks, and they were ridiculously expensive. Yeah, but to get the good ones, like the ones that they were using on tour, you had you had to send a, send away. And I had you know I had a Slayer patch on my on my jean jacket and a Metallica patch, and I just it just had this moment when I found out that it was a new Metallica cigar. It almost hit me more than the first Metallica cigar. I was just like, man, how cool is that? Like my youthful kind of world that I was obsessed with is now like fully entrenched with the cigar company that made me fall in love with premium cigars, Drew Estate. And I'm like, that's really fucking weird and really cool in a way. Uh, and that, that something from your childhood and something from you now find a way to, to get like Jonathan Drew and who, you know, the, the godfather of the rebirth of cigars, the guy who made the league, you know, responsible for the league of nine that, that got me to really, just fall head over heels in love with his industry blended a cigar with the fucking lead singer Metallica. Like that's crazy. It just uh, on a person, on a personal level, it just kind of was like, I just had a moment where I was like, this is really fucking cool. I hope I don't hate the cigar. And I don't. Can I, can I go full tut on you? Yeah. Lame. The idea of it. Hmm? It's lame. It's lame. Lame. Next thing, you know, next thing you know, you're going to have like a Carrie Underwood blend cigar. And then you're going to have like a Faith Hill blend cigar. I'll be like, oh, we're trying to get this demographic. And hey, we're trying to get this demographic. The only reason why I give the Black and Series a f is because it's good. It's not, I mean, it's just good. They're good okay, cigars. But, but what and about, what I, about what about this? I'm scrolling on Facebook and you know, when you scroll down and then there's the reels, the little videos that come up through your Facebook feed. Oh yeah. I hate those. There's reels of James Hetfield coming off stage while Kirk's doing a guitar <laughs> solo. A dude's got a fucking blackened cigar ready for him. He puts it in his mouth, lights it, sits That's down, marketing dude sits down for about a minute and smokes I'm just saying, I, I don't think, would you say a Reba McIntyre cigar? I don't think Reba's going to be fucking firing up, smoking a goddamn cigar. No, what Reba's going to be doing is Reba is going to be out in the tobacco field with a leaf. One chance leaf, don't let me down. Hey, That's going to be on the cover art. I mean, es es Espinosa makes a, a, a really, a couple really fucking good cigars with Guy Fieri. I, I I happen to think they're phenomenal cigars. Guy Fieri does events all over the country supporting. Yeah, of course, Tut. They're gonna make. They want to make money. 
They're not doing this for fun. I know that, but like, like, okay, so if you tell me that you're in a collaboration with a guy, Fieri, I'm like, that's kind of interesting because that's a chef. He's all about taste and stuff. And then when you tell me, oh, it's a collaboration with Hetfield, I'm going to be like, huh? Oh yeah, what? because you yeah, because he's not allowed to have any tastes. No, no, no. No, he is. But because I mean, Metallica. Like, all right. Metallica. Then, like, then, then why don't you say it's a collaboration with Tuttle? You know why you don't say it's a collaboration with Tuttle? Because nobody knows who the fuck Tuttle is. Well, you'd assume it tastes like pigeon herpes. <laughs> but dude, Metallica has and been in the whiskey. Metallica has been in the whiskey business for years. You're yeah, telling me yeah. that's not a logical connection with whiskey and cigars i'm just saying that i don't like this trend i don't like the whole celebrity collab trend uh it's nothing against it's nothing against metallica and all that like i said the cigar is really good i'll tell you what it is when you talked about saying you know especially when you're a crusty veteran no this is the stuff i look for this is the stuff this is the reason why i keep trying blend after blend is because i want something that's a little bit unique this delivers it it did, you're talking, I mean, yeah. You're talking about a band that resisted putting out a music video in the heyday of MTV when they could have sold a gazillion more records and they didn't want to do it. You're talking about a dude. So so you have a problem with Billy Gould of Faith No More coming out with his own rock yet? No, it's a passion project. Ted Bill's a cigar smoker. He can't be passionate about cigars. He doesn't no, need he the totally, money. He, to, he totally can. He God, totally can. I, I without googling it. But how many? How many other people are going to be out there just collabing? And I'm going to hold you to it. Every time I see a celebrity collab on a cigar, I'm going to be like, "Shut up and enjoy the cigar." And it's all about the taste. It's none. It's not about marketing. It's not about branding. It's all about that guy has good taste. And matter of fact, I'm going to use this argument a little later when we get into our movie tonight. Well, I well, like there, to are, there were a lot of people just collecting checks in tonight's movie. That's for I, certain. I would like to jump in there for a second, because uh, while I understand the emotion behind what you're saying, Tut, unfortunately, I really can't disagree with you more because every single consumer product and a cigar is a consumer product has an ad agency and a marketing campaign behind it. So, you know, to me, I actually, from what I've read and, and Kate has just talked about it, James Hetfield seems like he is a real deal who enjoys cigars. So it's actually a good fit for him to Kate's point. He doesn't need the money, but okay. Yeah. You know what? When I see, uh, the Casa Amigos commercial, and they show George Clooney on his motorcycle, and he's out in the field with the Mexican <laughs> workers, and he holds up his glass of tequila. And it's like George Clooney's never in his life gone out into a field with a bunch of blue collar workers and all the tequila. But everything has a marketing campaign behind it. And I guess mean, what? Casa Amigos is a wonderful, fantastic tequila, and George Clooney is a known heavy drinker. It but makes what, sense. What I'm, what I'm getting at is Drew Estate is wants to sell cigars and make money. So they found somebody they could partner with to market it. Of course, there's a marketing campaign behind it. I don't think, you know, if it's just like, just be about the taste, not the marketing, then then that person's going to have a lot harder time selling cigars. No, they're not. They, they, that in the, in this industry, that that's all the marketing you need. I mean, at least to get you through one season. Because because they're coming out with new brands constantly, you don't have to try to maintain brand loyalty on these celebrity cigars. You just hit it, boom, go. And that's, you know, it's a shame. I'm not saying that's what Drew Estate's doing at all. I'm not saying that at all. This is a good cigar. But it just... Consumers, we are bombarded with images in order to try and brainwash into buying products. And that's been going on for 50 years. And why why would a cigar company that has the money to partner with a recognizable person be any different? I And I was, I was just making fun of Clooney on the motor. So I was making fun of the marketing campaign itself. They absolutely ought to do it. Yeah, the, the marketing campaign for these, I, show, the marketing campaign for the Black and Cigars, shows uh Hetfield sitting in a lounge with uh Rob Dietrich the 
black and whiskey guy and Jonathan Drew smoking, smoking cigars. Um, the guy's been a cigar smoker for years. I think to say that I think it all just comes down to Metallica is a band that has said no to more shit than they've said yes to that could have easily made them millions of dollars. He seems pretty fucking into this. So does Guy Fieri. He seems really in and he seems really taken with when once he stepped foot and dipped his toes in the premium cigar world. Holy shit. This is a passionate fan base of millions and millions of people. I dig it. They look at cigars like my my people look at food as far as the components, as far as the flavors. Like to say that just on the surface, well, that's disingenuous. They're just in it for the money. I don't think you can. I don't think you can I do didn't that. say that. I didn't say that. Not in this case. I'm just saying I don't like the trend of it because it's yes, okay. Everything that you're saying, let's say, let's say it's absolutely true. Hesfield is a cigar aficionado who's been dreaming of making a cigar blend for the last 20 years. He finally gets a shot. Hmm. Drew Estate brings it in. There you go. It's great. Now all of a sudden, here comes J Lo, and she's doing a collaboration with Sweet Jane, and it's right. J Lo's rose. Michael I'm get, started doing Gatorade commercials 30 years ago. What's how's how's this any different from that? I'm it's and, not, and, and other he, than it's other than I don't like it. But Jordan, I can sit there and say I don't like sitting there watching J Lo in a Fiat commercial because I know J Lo's never sat and so in sat inside a Fiat in her well, life. Well, she also didn't have any input into the engine of the Fiat, and Jordan had no input to the ingredients of Gatorade. They actually show Hetfield with samples of you know going through the original black and trying to find something that that was what he was looking for now i'll give you an example of one to me that screamed the minute it was announced i was like this is this is such hype and I, I, i'm not gonna say hype because it wasn't like illusione did a cigar maybe two years ago with uh, uh jeremy piven <laughs> i hear he's a big good cigar smoker and it was like it was like an eighteen dollar cigar. It was this expensive cigar, and he he went to a few a few events. Haven't heard about it since. Haven't heard from Piven about it. Haven't heard about the cigar ever since. Um, <laughs> there and there's several there's several instances of that. A lot many with athletes though they'll, they'll do ath, you know athlete based cigars. This to me. M81 was successful, went back to went back to the drawing boards, came up with a, a an alternative. Headfield, you know, seems excited about that. He's not doing these aren't Metallica videos that I'm that's, watching that, of him smoking. These are fan videos of him in the pit having a smoke. But that's and, one of the things that makes this project a little bit different is that they've come back for a second iteration or or a second product in this line. It wasn't just a one off money grab. If you would, if people would have criticized, if people would have criticized the original Black End as a money grab, I would have had no defense for it because, like you said, it happens a lot. But the fact that it was successful, popularized, and they're coming back with a different iteration, you know, now it's not just a you know, take the money and run. Yeah. And, and Guy Fieri's on his like sixth or seventh, and he's at PCA every year, and he's around the yeah. country. Events. I, I think there are cases that you what you're saying rings true, Tut. And I agree. If there becomes a fucking Reba McIntyre cigar, I will be the first one to stand up and say, no. <laughs> no. Hi, I'm Dolly Parton, and I only shoot up Oklahoma black tar heroin. <laughs> and that's fine because Dolly is a national treasure. She can do no wrong. Yeah, see. Oh. What if she had pigeon like I fall for this with products I buy. Yeah, I'm not saying she did get pigeon herpes, and I'm not saying she didn't. <laughs> yes, Dolly. Her that killed Flacco. Her people killed Flacco. He knew too much. <laughs> On his deathbed, he's laying there after he smacked into that building. The answers are at Dollywood. Okay, well, I didn't expect to get into all that. We, we uh, but I, I guess we didn't review the first one on the show, so we never really talked about that aspect yeah. of it. I also like uh, it because we we get to flex our 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 tobacco roots. 
Uh, man, it's smoking. Look at that ash. By the way, uh, it is transferred. In, oh yeah, that looks nice. It is transferred into the on the sitting on the back of the palate into toasted marshmallow. I agree with Ty. On on the draw, just it it has that when that, it, that, when that, it that, just sits there for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Touch it, touch touch a gram in there through the draw. Not yeah, through the across the across the palate, like just take your take your draw, retro it, let it sit a little bit. That aftertaste that's sitting there in your mouth. Oh, so the finish, the finish yeah. is is charred. You know, I got I got charred marshmallow last show and whatever we were smoking. You you looked at me like I was crazy. You said it was uh something uh, some other and and you're you said you also get a little bit of gram on the finish. Well, Are and you, I, I I'm trying to do that because I was like, yes, that marshmallow, but I'm also I'm picking up. Like that, sort of that sweet cookie type thing, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it's my beer, but I, I'm thinking it's the cigar. Okay, well, hey, that's a good segue into tonight's the second component of what we do here: the beers, the booze. Um, I am drinking the Pigeon Herpes IPA from <laughs> Brooklyn Hipster Water Brewery. Brewery. Is that a hazy IPA or was it San Diego? Uh, it's a hazy San Diego. Okay. Notes of rat poison on the. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know what? Yaks. I think everybody's going to. I have a feeling everybody's going to have some interesting cigars tonight. And uh, I'm about to go get another one. So why don't we kick off with me for once? Tell everybody what I'm drinking. The Fresh Kicks Hazy IPA Real Ale Brewing. 6.6%, 40 IBUs. Of course, Real L, very well liked on TNCC. We've had their Axis IPA. And, of course, always their, one of our favorites, the Hans Pills. The only mm -hmm. Pilsner I drink? Well, until they change the cans. <laughs> uh, well, look, you can't, can't you keep it there. Hey, presentation, presentation matters. They had a great can, and they blew it. They had a great can. It was I, I I picked tonight's beer because we are going to be discussing the new Roadhouse movie, which I was hoping, hey, if you're going to make a new Roadhouse, there's got to be some fresh kicks in it, right? There's a lot of kicking in Roadhouse. And, well, there was nothing fresh about the new Roadhouse. And there was no, literally almost no kicking. So Boy, what are you I talking had, about, son? I had to go to the beer to get my fresh kicks because I didn't get it from the steaming pile of dog shit movie that we're going to talk about later. Uh, man, it's a good, it's a really good hazy. It's got really, uh, tropical, tropical flavors. I think there's some mosaic and Amarillo hops in there that always give you that kind of citrus aroma. Um, uh, it's not very bitter, but that's working out great with the cigar. Uh, it's really letting me get the, the kind of the creaminess and everything coming through on the draw. I'm a little behind you boys, so I haven't gotten the chocolate chip cookies or the graham cracker and marshmallow s'mores yet. I'm hoping to get that here in a minute. Uh, no, real oh. ales, real ales, a real one. Uh, I like their, I like their stuff a lot. And this, this beer is very good. So, uh, and it's like, it's 40 IBUs. It's not, uh, it's not interfering at all with the cigar. It's a good pairing. It's working out really well for me. Uh, and while I get another one, you know what? I'm just going to say this. Uh, thank God he never looks at the TNCC website and, and looks at his pairing grades. Uh, I am so proud of the doctor tonight. Oh, yeah. The doctor put on his big boy podcasting pants, said, you know what? I, I'm doing this. I am going to blow this crew out of the goddamn water. And he stepped up. And I'm not even talking about this isn't a home run. This is a grand slam of epic. Now, granted, I can't say pairing proportions because he's not he's not able to smoke a cigar with us, but film pairing proportions. So technically he can only get about a D plus. But Jesus Christ. <laughs> I am so proud of you, Doc. <laughs> Show us what you got and Cody, tell us all about it. The good doctor is having proper 12. Proper 12 Irish whiskey. Made in collaboration by none other than Conor McGregor himself. Another collab. 
Connor McGregor of the oh yeah, I'd like to hear you talk shit about his collaboration. I ain't talking shit about Connor McGregor. God damn right, God damn right you're not. Uh, going back to uh, 2018, uh, it uh, is a a blended uh, Scotch or uh, uh, Irish whiskey uh, uh, from single malt. Uh, it, it is a uh, was named after. Uh, the proper 12 actually comes from uh, Dublin 12, which is a postal code area for Dublin, of which where uh, McGregor grew up, which is uh, named Crumlin. So it, it goes back to his, where his youth. Okay. So I think at that. I, I should mention our, if you're, if you're living in a cave, the, uh, the new roadhouse, 2024 is the Roadhouse uh, stars UFC veteran Conor McGregor. And uh, when the doctor said he's, eh, I'll probably go and pick up some of that. You see commercials for it all the time. I was like, yeah, it'd be nice if he did, but I'm not going to hold my breath. He's he's going to he's he's going to come with his Oberon Weedale. And then he got it. He got it. <laughs> I, uh, I've only made the Oberon Weedale mistake once. I won't be making it again. Uh, but yes, I, I did go to my uh, local liquor confectionery store and pick up a bottle of the uh, proper 12 Irish whiskey. And you How said you said pre-show it's good. Uh, it is very good. Uh, I will also say that the retail price is extremely agreeable. Um, I purchased this in a... Um, a goody goody, which is a big giant liquor store, yeah. not quite as big as like a specs and a total wine, but a pretty big store. Um, and uh, I believe it was $24.98 for for the good big boy bottle, um, which is to me uh very inexpensive. Um, and uh you know, obviously there's different types of whiskeys. You have your scotch, your bourbon, and your Irish whiskey. Um, this is this is very smooth. Um I have been putting a substantial amount of ice in it, but really just cutting it, uh, just cutting it with a little water, uh, really just you need to cut it with something uh, rather than drink it just over the ice. So just cutting it with a little water, but it it is extremely smooth. Uh, it's got that kind of Irish whiskey smell to it, but um, uh, I, I wholeheartedly uh, recommend Conor McGregor's proper 12 Irish whiskey. If you get a chance now, there is, there's a, there's a second flavor there was some kind of like apple flavored one i don't fuck with any of that i ain't doing that i've never done that with my whiskeys i know crown royal has like an apple flavor i I don't do that so i can't vouch for the apple one but just the regular the regular irish whiskey one um if you are a fan of, of whiskey uh i wholeheartedly recommend it and i would say that ice cubes and maybe just a little a little bottled water or a little mineral water uh, I, I can't imagine, I, I know some people like to mix it with ginger ale, but man, this is really smooth. I would just say some ice and, and water would be all I would cut it with. Uh, it, it is very tasty. I, I'll, I'll definitely give it a try because I mean, it, it sounds interesting, but I'm actually more, more interested to try the, uh, Conor McGregor Reba McIntyre collab on the, uh, Apple, the Apple proper 12. There is there is no such product. There is an Apple product, but I, I do not believe that Conor McGregor has, has partnered with with Reba McIntyre on on anything. Um, and I think it's safe to say because he seems like one of those dudes that kind of pays attention to online trolls and can kind of get 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 baited into some like I I don't think there's any guys with with some sense in their heads that's gonna shit on his whiskey. Ugh. Are you are you suggesting, Cade, that I am being disingenuous in my no, brain? No, no, I know I know you. I've known you for forty years. I, I know that your your opinion is 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 solid as the day is long. Uh, I'm saying other other online uh, beer cigar film podcasters could probably uh, maybe be a little intimidated to criticize. Uh, but you know what? I, I'm going to criticize the hell out of the movies, and so I guess. I was about to say other cigar, other cigar podcasters, yes, but not the TNCC. TNCC, big huevos. Yeah, yeah. Take that, Reba McIntyre. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad it's good, and and I and I, I'm glad you picked it up. I, I'll do the same. I'll give it a shot. 
Uh, yeah. stupid so fancy I should like to point head. out too. Uh, you know what, Cade? Yeah, it's working. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, you sons of bitches. <laughs> uh, Tut, what are you drinking? What am I drinking, Yax? He has the Secret Beach IPA. Meanwhile, brewing out of Austin, Texas. Meanwhile, in Austin, Texas. <laughs> oh, God. Which I was really hoping that they actually did have a beer called Halls of Justice just so they could walk <laughs> like Meanwhile. The halls of justice. There's no, there's no beaches in Austin. It's a secret there, beach. There's there's some beaches, little beaches at Lake Travis and other places. That, well, so you got to have one to go to Hippie Hollow and places like that. Uh, or what they used to call Hippie Hollow. I don't know what it's called now. It's, it's, yeah, it's called Trump Condos. Uh, back, in the, back in the 90s when we were walking in barefoot down to Hippie Hollow, I'm just just between us boys. I I spent a weekend down there in college, and I came back with a wicked ass case of pigeon herpes. Pigeon herpes. <laughs> if y'all do, oh. I was smoking now, weed. The I was secret smoking, beach. I was it's smoking different. some primo grass with this cool owl named Flacco. Asked me if I wanted to freebase some rat poison. I was like, that's not really my thing, man. And he was like, all right. And then he gave me a drink. I didn't see him pour it. But I got a little woozy afterwards, and three days later, I test positive for fucking pigeon herpes. Wasn't the problem, though, that that grass was endorsed by former presidential candidate Bob Dole? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It was the 90s. Uh, (laughs) uh, Is it good, Tut? Yes. Oh, you know what? It it is described as as having... uh, Marmalade, blueberries, and the devil's lettuce. I don't get any of that, but I do taste the devil's lettuce. You're getting oh. marijuana? No, I'm not getting that. I no, like I'm this. I'm not quite sure why anyone would describe it as the devil's lettuce. Dude, I love this. The uh, goat. I looked when Tut showed, sent you the beer he's doing. I looked it up, and on their on their webs, this is so. This is the most Austin fucking thing I've ever read. Goes well with. Like food pairings, uh-huh. pea soup, California burritos, Takis Fuego, which are these little spicy chips that my kid eats, char grilled vegetables. Oh, please tell me South Korean street tacos. Lazy beach afternoons. Char grilled vegetables. Give me a fucking break. It's actually really good. Uh, it, it's light. It's got a great great citrus smell uh coming off of it uh it's not too citrusy but it's definitely it's got a presence there uh the hops i'm not an ipa drinker but to me i would i would put it like a 55 you know it's pretty it's pretty you know it's kind of hoppy but it's not really that it's not bitter that much it's got a little bit of a bite stop laughing mincy uh i just find it (laughs) i just find it good Maybe that's that, the devil's lettuce talking. I uh, <laughs> that is the devil's lettuce talking. Uh, is it pairing well with a cigar? I'm giving it lots of space. Uh, the cigar has a lot of interesting stuff going on. I don't want the beer to push it out of the way, and it it kind of it kind of can. You don't want that uh, marmalade to interfere with your your your. Yeah. I don't want blueberries and le- I don't want blueberries and let- uh, devil's lettuce mixing in with my toasted marshmallows, man. I mean, come on. Okay. Well, finally, Yagboy, our resident beer expert and handsomest bartender at O'Brien's Irish Pub in downtown. <laughs> Historic. Bless you. Excuse me. Bless you. Bless you. Historic Temple, Texas. Guys, I have about two hours left before my allergy pill totally gives out. So, uh, I, I I'm trying to do the pollen here in Central Texas. I walk out it's to my nuts. truck. I literally I, walk out to my truck. Sounds like pigeon herpes to me. Uh, I, I may have partaken in some of the devil's lettuce earlier. Uh, mixed. I I I do have pigeon herpes. Um, <laughs> and there's no shame in that. Sounds maybe. Pretty- Maybe you should look in the mirror, guys. There, there's, a, there's a little shame in that. I'm, I'm oh, just, no, no, I was bluffing. There's a lot of shame. 
It's the worst thing you can have. Uh, I don't. I don't want to be known as the weird dude who did stuff with pigeons. Uh, I hey, I was on the roof of doctor's office. I saw the cage with all the pigeons. They had these little messages. Oh, was there? Gave you some dull pills, and there you go. I was just gonna read the little messages tied around their necks. And one thing you know, I had had some Chianti, and I woke up with pigeon herpes. It wasn't the experiment that I was intending, but uh, <laughs> experiment nonetheless. Uh, who? <laughs> uh, Yak boy, what are you drinking? Well, from Melvin Brewing out of Alpine, Wyoming, I am having the Asterisk. The Asterisk Imperial <sighs> IPA. Just like our movie needed an asterisk in the title <laughs> I guess, I guess to let us right know away. to let us know that in title only this movie is only similar in title only brilliant brilliant uh you you may have just earned you a c plus pal uh, it's at least uh, would it be more would it be more accurate to say it was a, more like a c asterisk it's he, he might get an asterisk. Uh, man, that's a good call. Uh, man, have we ever had a Wyoming beer before? I was the first one. I I saw this and uh, you know I was curious because I I thought because there is a uh, brewery called Symbol Brewing and I had the symbol. I was like, but then I realized it was actually a. I, I had never heard of Melbourne before, so I thought I'd give it a whirl. I like the band, the Melvins. I don't know if they have just Melvin Brewing. Oh God, they they're like the most authentic heart. They've been in the game for decades. If if they came out with cigar, Tut would lose his fucking mind. Uh but anyway, um yeah, the Melvin's rock. Uh so is it good? It is nine percent. So like I said, but it is an Imperial IPA, so it, it's pretty high up there. It says it's like 80 IBUs, but I would probably put knock that down at about 50 or 60. I find but most it does have a really good uh, sort of citrus component to it. It's not hazy, so. Yeah. But like I said, I was concerned because I was my the way it was interacting with the cigar, whether or not it was because of that citrus component. Was it making the cigar? Was it giving it a sweetness? Because it had that that it had that strong hay sort of you know bit of earth smell to it. I didn't know if the 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 adding a sweeter component was going to interact with that on the cigar. I don't think it is. I'm still getting a really strong sort of sweetness from my cigar. And I don't know if that was, I don't think that's the beer. No, there's definitely a sweet component, especially on the retro hail. And then right after the retro hail sits on the palate a little bit. Uh, yeah. That, that, the pepper is, you know, very, very nice. Not overpowering at all. And uh, the pepper is uh, very consistent. Yeah. It's uh, man. I'm sorry. I don't. I uh, interrupted your beer talk. Go ahead. No, no. I, that's where I was. That's just what I thought. Well, that's, you know, that's weird. I, that it's that's weird. Yaks. That it's citrus forward. I found with most of the imperial IPAs, they tend to go a little malty, and they're they they tend to pour a little darker. Uh, it's it's and it's I know. That, oh, yeah. See that that looks great. See I. These terms are so there's so many breweries calling shit and there's no like law of the land. You can call it whatever the fuck you want to call it. And it's like I would say a good three fourths of the Imperials I've had have been darker and maltier and really, like you said, yaks lower on the bitterness than what they claim to be. Eighty nine. No, they're usually in the 60s. And. Man, for an IPA lover, I tend to kind of steer clear of the imperials because they are too they are more malty and lose some of the the stuff i like about ipas the bitterness the 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 floral the citrus the you know the bright stuff um but it sounds like you may have found a diamond in the rough there my friend out of wyoming of all places i know and of course their tagline for if for their brewery is remember if your beer is not madness it's not beer so I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen. I don't think it'll be a pigeon herpes, though. I, As French brewmaster Jacques Pierre once said, every beer needs a moment of madness. 
You know, boys, I actually, as as Yax was describing his beer. I'm getting the, underneath that pepper on the retro ale. Like I said, it's very consistent, medium strength white pepper on the retro ale. I'm getting a salty kind of mustiness that is what I recognized in the original M81. I think I'm, I, I'm no master blender by any means. I think that that might come from the Pennsylvania tobacco because I also get it from that green sucker leaf that's in the Neanderthal Pennsylvania tobacco and the Roma Cross Neanderthal cigar that on the back end of the retro hill in your nose is that kind of salty kind of mustiness. It's very distinct. And I, I'm going to guess that that's that Pennsylvania tobacco that's common in both black and cigars. But I'm going to give you this. Well, I'm still getting cedar and primary, uh, really smooth leather on the draw. The finish, as I as I let the finish linger, if I don't take a sip, no tut. It's not marshmallow. I, I'm getting a little Yak Boys graham cracker. There is a cookie kind of graham cracker sweetness on it's the It's part of the s'mores combo. Maybe I'll get the marshmallow. Stay tuned, everybody. Uh, hey, speaking of tasty cigars, oh, this is going to be weird. You know, you know who makes some damn well good ones, Ted? Drew Estate. Yeah, how'd you know? Uh, that's oh. right. And Drew Estate has a stick out right now that y'all will definitely want to get your hands on. Not this one. Uh, dark, bold. <laughs> I was actually gonna. I was supposed to update the script to this one. I was like, can we? Wait one episode because it's <laughs> really weird if I'm doing commercials for this cigar while I review the cigar. Uh, this is actually, as I read it, just as weird. Um, uh, Drew State has a stick out right now that y'all definitely want to get your hands on dark, bold, and unapologetic. Black and Cigars M81 by Drew Estate, and it's an intense journey into uncharted, deepest, darkest, and heaviest depths of Maduro tobacco, a masterpiece collaboration between Tut's favorite. Metal frontman Metallica's James Hetfield, uh, Sweet Amber Distilling's Rob Dietrich, and Drew Estate's Jonathan Drew. The All Maduro Blackened Cigars M81 by Drew Estate is rich and powerful, but beautifully balanced. That's true. Offering tantalizing notes of leather, chocolate, and espresso that's perfect for both life's celebrations and times of reflection. It's so damn good, it will almost make you forget about the Black Album. Almost. Well, folks, it's time for the fire pit session of the show. Uh, now this is the portion where we do a roundtable wrap-up of some of the things we've all been viewing or reading recently so that maybe you at home get your interest peaked and check out some new stuff that maybe you weren't aware of or perhaps you were on the fence about soaking in. Doctor, I'm going to start with you uh, as you've recently taken a walk down memory lane, sort of, in that you've watched a few movies that are deeply entrenched in nostalgia uh, but did they offer anything new that's worthy of their cinematic predecessors? That doctor is the million dollar question. And I think it's safe to say it's not too soon to tell. Uh, it is for once, Cade. It is actually, I can't even believe I'm saying this. The fissure might open up in the earth, but it is not too early to tell. I think this might be a first. It's not too soon to tell. Do uh, doctor, I'm going to start. You recently checked out Indiana Jones and the Dildo of Destiny. I did, yes. Uh, the Dial of Destiny. Dial, Dial of Destiny. Dial, Dial. That was a movie I watched with my other podcast. Um, uh, we'll be discussing that tomorrow night. I'll be discussing that on the Thursday night show. Um, Doctor, what'd you think? Uh, I, I got to admit, first two movies, classics. I will admit, I, I don't go back to Raiders Lost Ark and Temple of Doom very much. Uh, if I catch them on TV, I'll watch a little bit and it brings back happy, warm memories. Mm -hmm. I was not a big a fan of The Last Crusade, as as I know you three were. Thought it was an equal uh, entry, uh, a worthy entry into the original trilogy. The Crystal Skull man was just god awful, uh, un 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 unreasonably bad, um, and it certainly turned me off. And I kind of hope they would never dip their creative uh, pens in the ink again, but they did. I mean, Harrison Ford's what his eighties now. I believe he yes. has just turned eighty. Yeah, but I was surprised to learn, Doctor, that 
it was a step in the right direction and a an improvement upon the crystal skull, right? And and that statement doesn't say a whole lot because I'm with it you. Oh. It, it, I know it doesn't, but you actually you actually got something out of it. I did. I because of the crystal balls. Again, we'll be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, no, because of that one, um, I still have uh, the Disney Plus streaming service, and and it's on there, so I didn't have to pay anything extra to watch it. And it had been there for a little while now, and yeah. uh, I guess I did have some trepidation about uh watching it just because of how thoroughly i did not enjoy the last one i do go back and watch the original three uh mm -hmm. you know i mean maybe even once a year you know I, I usually every summer as we get close i i usually do a, a trip through the jaws franchise uh but i do go back and watch those three with some regularity uh so i actually Right before I went on vacation, um, I was actually kind of getting bothered pretty badly by allergies. It felt like I had a cold, but um, so it was a Sunday evening a few weeks back, and I decided to take the plunge on it. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, it's a fun movie. Um, it, uh, you know, nothing at this point, I can watch it without making any kind of comparisons. Um, and there's something to be said when we get into our film later tonight about that you know, making a comparison between a movie now and a movie released in the 80s. But uh, it was a fun movie. Um, they did uh, have a, a rather lengthy opening scene that's supposed to be taking place at the end of World War II in 1945. Wow. And since the original three movies all took place in the late 30s, they, they do the, uh, I guess, digital enhancing, that you want to call it, of... Yeah. Indiana Jones, uh, making Harrison Ford from, from the 80 year old guy he is. Uh, and we'll say this for a guy who's 80, he looks very good. He does not look like an 80 year old man. Um, but they do the, they do the little digital making him like where he's, you know, about 40 ish or so. Uh, it was better than De Niro's young De Niro in the yes. Irish. It, yes. it was, it was substantially better. Um, I, I don't know how they do those things. I, I don't know if it was just Harrison Ford's voice, I'm assuming, and they had a younger actor maybe doing the physical movements in that early part. Um, yeah, they have they have green. Uh, it's all mocap. Okay, they because so so they made that work, um, but they they have that opening scene to sort of create the setup and and the the artifact that's going to be involved, uh, and then it, it jumps ahead to. You can find out what year it is because the, the astronauts have supposedly returned from the moon landing. So that, that means it's 1969, uh, which really would put him then at about uh, 65 years old because he's also retired. <laughs> he, he's also retiring from a job. Uh, he's now teaching at a, a ancient history at a, at a college in New York. And so you can kind of fix that from the, the timeline and and the retirement that he's supposed to be about 65, which is really probably about what he looks. He really doesn't look like he's, he's in decent shape. Uh, you know, he, he doesn't, he doesn't look like a, I mean, there's guys who are 80 that can't, can't walk. I mean, they hobble around. So um, he's definitely in good condition for his age. I'll give him yeah. that. Uh, so I thought, I thought it was a good story. I thought it moved pretty well. Um, I thought that, you know, they, they always kind of, dip their toes to use a phrase that Cade used earlier. They do all, all the movies kind of dip their toes a little bit into a supernatural element at some point, um, which is usually the weakest point, but uh, they kept the story going pretty good. Um, if there's any one fault that I, if you want to nitpick at, it's the fact that even if we're going to buy him as a guy in his mid sixties, rather than 80, he's still really running and jumping off of <laughs> jumping in and off of moving cars and trains and, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, at one point he does make a comment, like he's climbing some wall with this, this young, young British chick. That's like a daughter of an old contemporary of his. And he, he kind of stops and he makes some sort of comment. She's like, why have you stopped? And he's like, he says some kind of comment, like my shoulders are wrecked. My vertebrae are collapsing. He's like, I, I got a plate in my knee. He does, he does kind of comment on it. <laughs> well, no, I, I actually said those exact words to my kid as I, I hurt myself getting off the couch the other day. <laughs> She's like, dad, what's wrong? I was like, oh, my shoulders are shot. I got cracked ribs. <laughs> he does, he does, I can, I, can, can I comment, Mincy? 
please do. No, but, but, the, but the thing is, she was like, oh, like, how'd you hurt yourself? I'm like, just now getting off the couch. <laughs> That's how I read it. Overall, I do want to hear your input, Todd. I say overall, I enjoyed the movie. You know, don't you don't go back and compare it to those flicks from the 80s. Uh it it it, it definitely gets the 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 crystal skulls taste out of your mouth. Um, if you look at it as a standalone pick, uh a standalone flick. Um uh so yeah, it, it was fun. It was a fun movie. I, I'd recommend it if you haven't seen it yet. Okay. I uh I I want to agree with you on, on a lot of things. And the only thing that I would do is that, you know, you don't need Harrison Ford doing a lot of the action sequences. You know, he it, first of all, it's laughable to try to pass him off at 65. I think he looks good for an 80-year-old, but I think he also looks like an 80-year-old, too. I uh, he walks like it. Uh, there's only one scene where he's actually shirtless and the dude looks good. I hope I look like the it, that, you know, at 65 versus 85. Yeah, no, he, has, he has an ab outline. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, it, it, it looks good. Yeah. Tut, I think it, Tut's a rough looking 65. <laughs> True. <laughs> I just turned 50. <laughs> uh, and, but uh, the only thing that I, would, I mean, well, there's a lot of things that I could actually really go critical on, but I, th I think it was a step in the right direction. It was a fun movie. It was definitely hands and shoulders above the last offering. Uh, the only thing that I just, I can't forgive is that there's this one sequence where Indy is running across the top of the train as it's going across and the CGI looks so bad. It looks like I did it. I put together that effect scene. I was just like, how can you be like this big budget dude? And then, you know, you throw that. I don't I, I don't even know who did the uh, effects on the scene. But that's really the only only nitpicking thing. Well, I thought it was interesting seeing him in the 70s or the, you know, late 60s. I thought that was a cool. Can I say this? As someone who hasn't seen the film, can I say that? One, I'm glad to hear that they turned it around and maybe I can't imagine they're going to do another one when he's in his 90s. But if, if uh Indiana Jones and the colostomy bag of justice. But but I I will say this. I have noticed a change in Harrison Ford, the person. He he went through one of those things that I, I, I certainly witnessed in my own life with my my grandpa, where they're the guys get to a certain age and they just really get grouchy and really impatient with people. And just, uh, just real, real kind of bastards to be around. And for for a, a lot of time, that was Harrison Ford's kind of thing, in interviews, and and he always had a reputation as being grumpy, even when he was a younger guy. Over the last couple of years, that dude, if you watch him on a talk show or on things, the guy has lightened up. I think he's kind of at that at, he he kind of turned a corner in his old age where he's making jokes about Star Wars where before he wouldn't even really want to talk yeah. about Star Wars. He's making light of himself and his his own kind of image. And I think a lot of that has he has a younger kid. Uh not younger, he's probably a teenager, but I mean I think I think there's some things in his life that when you marry a younger boy, well, he's married to Ali McBeal, uh, Callista Flockhart. Yeah. Who's still a very sexy, vibrant, uh, she's about our age, I think. And, oh, she's huh? She's old. She's way older than that. Is she? Is she in her fifties, bro? She might be 60 now. No, 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 no. There's no way. She looks great. But anyway, he's got a kid who's, who's a teenager. He's got this younger wife. He just seems to be having more fun with his career, his legacy and talking about it and doing things. And I, it sounds like maybe that aided this movie in that, you know, if you're, if you're going to be still be doing these movies at his age, you, you better at least be having fun. I, I turned a corner on Harrison. Cause like, I, I was just like, I was in that camp, you know, Harrison was always grumpy and, Y'all yeah, pointed it out, and I, I started watching him. I'm like, dude, man, Hans kind of being a fucking asshole, and uh, so I just kind of, I, I just kind of, you know, kind of started brushing him off. But 
but I turned the page on him uh, in the Expendables outtakes where there's this oh, one outtake where he was like, you know who killed them? Me. I did that. <laughs> and it was just this fun little riff. Yeah. And Stallone said he was. Scene. Stallone and said I he was. I, I forgot he was in that. Stallone says we're fun. That I, I just looked up Doctor. Cal- we we're both right. Callista Flockhart's fifty nine, so she's almost in her sixties, but she looks. She still looks dynamic. Uh, she was really good. She did a run on the old Supergirl series. Remember that Yanks? Yeah. Where she, she was the publisher of the Daily Planet, and uh, she was yeah, so right. good in that. Yeah, she was so good in that. Um, but anyway, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to watch it. I have Disney Plus, and other than fucking Bluey or whatever the hell my kid watches on there, we never get our money's worth. I'm not watching any of that Star Wars crap. So I will watch Indiana Jones and the Dildo of Destiny. Dude, you have to take on it. What, Tut? You have to watch Ahsoka, man. It's the oh, second yeah, best like character in the entire franchise. Hey, I'm sorry. That Boba Fett series really rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, understandable. Understandable. But then get this: the doctor decided to go another. He 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 shook the dice and was like, "I'm going again." Indiana Jones paid off. I'm gonna I'm gonna roll the dice again. He didn't stay. And the other night on uh, I think he was streaming on uh, his cable network. He uh, he watched Ghostbusters Afterbirth. Uh, it's Afterlife. Afterlife. After, afterlife. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, and not the new one that's in theaters. I think that's Frozen Empire. Right. Uh, this one came out about three years ago, 2021, uh, starring uh, one of the, the kids from Stranger Things and Paul Rudd. And again, I don't think the doctor regretted watching it. Doctor, am I right? That is correct. Um, kind of watched on a whim, just because like you mentioned, I saw it was, uh, I have a, in addition to the multiple streaming services that I pay for and don't get my money's worth out of most of the time, other than Prime and Shudder, uh, I have Spectrum Cable and saw that they occasionally have movies on there that are, are streaming. Uh, so I, I saw Ghostbusters Afterlife was there and I took the plunge on that. Um, I would, uh, I'll be honest, I never, I never saw the... Uh, the Ghostbusters movie with the female Ghostbusters, the one that I terrible. absolutely terrible. And, and I, I literally lasted less than fifteen minutes. Didn't I watched see. the whole thing. It was just, and and that's not sexist. It's not. I know. It, it was just a bad movie. It was just a bad movie. It was. It it, I, it did not follow the tone of any of the previous movies. They tried to. They basically had tried to make it a musical. I was like, this is not. It's like watching like Ghostbusters cartoon. It, it's and not- I love musicals, and I love the Ghostbusters cartoon. No, no. I actually uh, am one of those people that, while the, obviously the first one is a classic motion picture from the eighties, I actually got a kick out of the the sequel from I think eighty nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nothing wrong with it. Nothing can't wrong hold with the, the, the first one, but I actually got a kick out of it. it has some good stuff in it. Um. So this movie, uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife, I, I also thought, uh, kind of similar to the description I gave with with Indiana Jones, it was a fun flick. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, you know, Paul Rudd is one of those guys. I, I, you know, I know he he went and did the Ant Man movies and probably made a bunch of money. I've, I've never really seen him in anything. He's been in some bad flicks. I've never seen him where I disliked him. Um, he's playing just a, a school teacher in the small town. And, Oklahoma. Um, a quick setup. It's it's the the main character. Well, one of the main characters is a, a single mom, and and she's supposed to be the the estranged daughter of of Egon Spangler, the Her- Harold Ramis, who has passed away in real life. So they kind of do a quick scene with a CGI double where they show him passing away because he's already been dead for several years. Uh, and then and she moves with her two kids to this town in Oklahoma, to this dilapidated farm that that he owned. Um, and, and then there's a, you know, without going into it, obviously there's a, there's a ghost story going on there in that town. Uh, and Rudd is the local high school teacher that, that befriends their family. It's a fun movie. Um, you know, it kind of, it, it had a good pace to it. There's, it, there's some parts of it that are really slow burn. Um, it's fun. Uh, if you're looking to see in, in Ghostbusters Afterlife, I don't know what the Frozen Empire one holds, 
Uh, if you're looking to see the remaining three surviving Ghostbusters of Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Ernie Hudson, they are not in this movie very much. Uh, they're only in it for for a couple of scenes towards the end. It's mostly, and that's not a spoiler. It really, I think you kind of get that if you watch a trailer. Yeah, it really doesn't include them very much. Um, and uh, I still don't think this is a spoiler. I just I got to get it off my chest. I think I mentioned this to Cade. Uh, uh, I'm going to be truthful about everything later on. Um, I would I would be afraid of, of Conor McGregor. Uh, you know, I don't think he's going to watch the movie and try to find my apartment and, and or watch our show and try and find my apartment if I disagree with anything. Uh, and it turns out I don't have anything bad to say about him. I'm not worried if Bill Murray wants to wants to come get some. Uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I can take him. Um, I, I like Bill Murray. Uh Boy, I, I mentioned it briefly to Cade when we were talking about this. Did he just look totally disinterested uh, when he showed up? Man, he just, it, it was, I don't know if it was poor writing. Uh, I know that Murray is notorious for being a guy who ad-libs, and he knocked a game full of Grand Slams when he did that through the movie Kingpin, but that was almost 30 years ago. Uh, I don't know if he's ad-libbing and reading the lines. He... The scene, the scene with those guys is just bad. It just uh, didn't, yeah. It, it just, it doesn't work. They don't really need to be there. It, it's cool to see them and everything. They, they, none of them really look bad for their age because they all got to be around seventy. Um, but uh, uh, it, first, it was, Ernie looks great. Ernie, Ernie looks, looks great. Good. Um, you know, they're. It was cool to see them, but that was, I thought, the weakest part of the movie. And with Murray, it was just, it was like. It just looked like they were. I was reminded of, of this this the snippet I read once where, uh, prior to the latest Star Wars trilogy, that George Lucas apparently had lunch with Mark Hamill. Prior to the Force Awakens, like when it was in the early de pre development stages, or it was maybe it was going to happen. It wasn't even in development, and apparently George Lucas said something to Mark Hamill like, "You know they're going to do this because it was like Disney owned it and everything." It was like this is going to happen, so. It'd be cool if it happened with you, but basically it's going to happen anyway. Uh, yeah. I kind of feel like that was the conversation somebody had with Murray. Like, hey, they're going to kick the tires with, with Ghostbusters again and restart it. Uh, you can boycott the thing if you want, but uh, it's going to happen anyway. So you may as well take the seven-figure paycheck for two days worth of work. And it, it just seemed like that's the attitude that he had with I, it. I, I think you're right because I do remember uh, him being very on the record that he wasn't interested in doing a Ghostbusters project. But so I, liked, I, also, I liked the other one. It, it is a fun oh, flip. I was gonna say I just felt like you know they could have utilized the the those actors differently in that movie. In other words, the way they use them, they didn't necessarily need to. It seemed I think forced, they, they right? It seemed forced, right? Yeah, like it was almost like, well, let's let's put them in a scene where it just right. Know. And I felt that that wasn't the scene for them. They didn't. I, like, I don't I think like they the, contributed. I, I like Did you the Aykroyd as the shop owner, you know, the Ghostbusters are kind of, you know, debunked or whatever, you know, there wasn't a big call of it to where, you know, it kind of explains like why the Ghostbusters aren't prevalent. Like where did all the ghosts go after New York? What about this? I, I haven't seen the movie, but what about this? These kids are the grandchildren of Harold Ramis, who's deceased. What about a scene where they go and track down Dan Aykroyd and Murray and Hudson and they agree to meet them maybe in the library from the first film, the the the, the Metropolitan Library, and they ask about tell me about our grandfather. And there's like a yeah. heart there's like a heartfelt scene where it's just these three older guys telling about their time fighting ghosts. Like one scene. Just to help, cool. these, help these kids understand about who their grandfather was, and that's it. It's would, just would that have felt nice idea? Um, they the the little girl calls Ackroyd in a shop was Tut's referring to, and that just seems stilted. It just seemed that that whole the dialogue there. We're gonna talk about yeah. some dialogue later. It seems uh, like you could have had a really tender scene because Ramus was such a Ramus was such a loved figure by even people that don't love people like Bill Murray, who's, you know, he's kind of a hard ass. 
seems like everybody kind of liked Harold Ramis and maybe they could have a really warm little scene there with the grandkids and they get them out of there. They don't have to throw on the proton packs and all that shit. Real like quick, I, said, they, I just felt like they utilized them. They, they could have done something. It, it could, they could have helped in the scene, but they didn't need them in the yeah. middle. Okay. Real quick. If I can jump back, there was something I wanted to say, and it came up again in this, in this film. When you were talking about the de-aging technology that they used on Harrison Ford, Doctor, in the Indiana Jones film, and then you said they did something similar to Harold Ramis in this film. Well, just a digital representation. They didn't de-age him. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but they 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 used CGI to, to recreate him, basically. Yeah. yeah. I just want to give a shout out to a, a director who is his early stuff. I'm always in awe of his later stuff, eh. but you can't deny his early stuff. Ridley Scott, when he did the original director's cut of Blade Runner for DVD, he wanted to include a scene with Harrison Ford, who by then was obviously decades older than he was in Blade Runner. And it's a scene in a phone booth. I could be, I drink a lot. This could be wrong, but I, but, but, but the, the gist of it is, is accurate. Where he was on the phone in a, in a, a Chinese restaurant in the world of Blade Runner. And uh, I believe it was the scene right before Joanna Cassidy gets shot through the glass, uh, the replicant. He got, rather than try some ham-fisted CGI nonsense, he got Harrison Ford's 30-something-year-old son, who's never acted, who's shunned his, doesn't have anything to do with show business, but looks a lot like Harrison Ford from like his first marriage. He got him to come in to use his profile in that scene and then he took because they'd actually shot the scene, I think, with with Ford, but you couldn't see his face or his his lips weren't right for the talking what the dialogue they need to do. So he he brought in Harrison Ford. This is in the early two thousands, I think. He brought in Ford's thirty year old son and filmed him in this scene wearing Ford stuff and used his mouth because it looked like his dad. And I thought that was the most amazing at the time. I thought like, wow. And it looks, it looks great on film. And I was like, yeah, but maybe not everybody has an offspring that looks like them that you can get on camera. True. But I just, I, 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 I'd much prefer if that is an option. Uh, It was just such a cool way to do it. And uh, much more so than take a fake AI thing of somebody's face and, 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 you know, kind of try to tr- trick us. Um, but anyway. yeah, especially, especially when you can't trick us. I mean, everybody knows that he's no longer here. I yeah. Mean, yeah. A tiny part. It, it, you're right. I agree with you. It's a tiny part of Ghostbusters afterlife. I, I just, uh, I'd say I enjoyed it. That's another one I would say to, to watch if you get a chance and just, you know, if you're a fan of Ghostbusters, I agree with you. Uh, okay. Actually, I I loved Ghostbusters growing up. I was a Ghostbuster for Halloween, and I cannot tell you the last time I fucking watched that movie. It might have been when I was a kid. I haven't gone back to that well in in forever. I will say this. uh, There's a scene towards the very end uh, at the climax of it. uh, Brought a little tear to my eye. I'm not going to lie. I I kind of teared up at it. I thought it was good. All right. Well, Tut. You're on the hot seat. You said that you recently watched the new Millie Bobby Brown Netflix movie, Damsel, 2024's Damsel, several times in a row. I'm guessing I, you, no, I'm guessing you weren't tuning into the dragons, you filthy pervert. Is dragon herpes a thing? Is there dragon herpes? If it was, I'd probably have them. <laughs> well, there's a dragon movie on Netflix starring the girl from Stranger Things, and Tut watched it for some reason. Uh, oh, for, uh, no, I'm I'm not going to apologize for my love of dragons. I love dragons. I'm a big D and D nerd. Uh, but you also so when 
You also love Millie Bobby Brown. I'm not going to lie. I do. I really do. Yeah. Uh, so when Netflix puts a poster of a big dragon up there, I don't know anything about the movie, but I'm going to go click. And I did. Uh, and then I was like, oh, that's a Stranger Things girl. And I like her. I, I, I think that she is growing into a, a special young actress. Uh, she has got control of her face. She has this this she has this ability to do like Gandalf any type micro gestures. That's really, really good. Uh, it really is. And I can't wait to see what she does as she grows old, older in her craft. Uh, you know, the movie you know itself. What, you know what? Uh, I can't believe I'm doing this. I'm going to back you up on that. And just, I've only seen her in stranger things, but so much of her stuff, especially the 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 flashback stuff with Michael Modine, the Papa stuff. Uh, yeah, she does have a a a way of expressing things subtly uh, without words that is uncommon for an actress her age, especially back then when she was a kid. Yeah. Uh, dude, I'm gonna give you that one. Okay, all right. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where she picked it up. I don't know if it comes natural, but man, just just keep doing it. Uh, I will say that she needs to, if she's gonna do some fantasy action movies, she needs to learn how to swing an axe and a sword uh because it's not believable there's this one scene where she's chopping wood that i was just like dude who told you how to hold an axe but uh she does a really good job in it uh the dragon's voiced by i don't know the lady's name uh but it's the uh uh main un secretary from uh the uh uh the expanse uh, she's uh, she's the old Indian lady that sounds uh, like she's chain smoked for 23 years. And yes. it's really, really good. Uh, and, and she sounds perfect in the dragon. Uh, the story itself is kind of interesting. Um, I mean, it, it was just a fun little flick. I mean, it's, it wasn't great. It wasn't anything that I would say that you had to go rush out and see. But if you're a fan of uh, fantasy type movies, you needed a little dragon slaying uh, thing, you know, Go go check it out, uh, Millie. Like I said, Millie is actually turning into a nice little actress, and I can't well, wait to see what she does. Well, that I can see. Uh, so the the dragon talks with a human voice. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's much like Dragonheart, where you had Dennis Quaid as a knight and Sean Connery as the voice of a dragon. Out of all the people in this video uh don't don't question yaks and i about the voice of dragons i i was just going to comment that i i don't watch a lot of dragon stuff and the idea of a dragon talking like with human words seems really stupid no you yeah i haven't i haven't seen the movie of myself but did the dragon have a name uh i don't know if they ever i don't know if they ever said it Mm. Or they just called it dragon. Uh, no, dragon. No, uh, I think I think I, I think Doctor would agree with me here. I Doctor, don't you think like because Game of Thrones those those big dragons if they had stopped it's, different, like, it's a different hey, style though. Come here. <laughs> Get over here! Like, come on, that's crazy. That's stupid. It's with not one, stupid. Possible, one possible exception, you have Brad Dorif doing it like he did Chucky. Like, you know, the dragon delights, and like, hey, it's a dragon, and he's all, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, or the leprechaun, like, <laughs> where's me gold? Oh, I'm yeah, a dragon. Really. Where's oh, me? Oh, wait, that's Connor McGregor in Roadhouse. Make it a witch. <laughs> where's me ice cubes? Oh, <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm I'll like, be back in a shanty in the moment. Well, dude, doctor, take a, take a break to get a fresh drink, and, uh, oh, man, Tut is nubbing that son of a gun. Man, look at this, I'm I've been pup, but I did start a little behind you guys. But man, I've still got to. I've been, I've been nursing it. I, I wanted to to keep it going as long as possible. Tut, final thoughts. Love it. It's uh, my favorite cigar that we've done this year. Really, you said that about the last cigar we did. This is I really better. Like this, I really like this. Uh, all the notes that it's hitting is right in my wheelhouse. Like I said, I. I always like when I go into a cigar shop, 
I always like pick something familiar and then I always pick something new because I just want to explore. I just want to expand, you know, my knowledge. I just want to expand my taste. I want to try to develop my palate ever more. And it's funny because you always try to try to balance that line but between just getting something that you enjoy to enjoy. But I, I just like the, the exploration. Uh, and so when I, when something pops like this, it yeah. really reminds me of why I love cigars. I mean, it just, there's those moments to where it's just like, this is a great time with friends. This is a great time. You know, my week has been all kinds of shitty and I've got this cigar, I've got friends, I've got, you know, mediocre conversation and it just works. Mediocre at best. Um, <laughs> did you just say you like to expand your palate ever more? Did you throw an ever more in there? You've been watching oh, too many. Oh. He watched that dragon film. He's been watching way too many fucking dragon movies. I just like to expand my cigar experiences ever more. Nobody Very talks like I that. Say unto thee. We got to start calling well, time. Then, sally We're- forth and continue on your journey. Well, thank you, Millie Bobby Tuttle, for the... Uh... No, you know what? You're right. You're abs- Not that you need me to validate you, but uh, I'm going to join in with you there. There is, there is something about going into a cigar shop like Smoker's Abbey in, in Austin, uh, your local shop, grabbing something that you know what you're going to get, but before you smoke that, ask tell your tobacconist what you're in the mood for. Or just saying, surprise me. I and, always do. And tell me why, or tell me what this is going to be and why you're giving it to me. And it is fun. It is, it is, and it's not, it's hit or miss. You yeah. know, you're, well, you're going to get I'll tell you what's even more interesting is that Ian over uh, his palate is a little bit different, but I love hearing, like, like you said, tell me why, tell me why this, because I love hearing what he likes about it. And then I try it and I, I try to see if it's there. Yeah, um, it, it is. And it makes it fun and it makes it, it gives you something when you set fire to that new cigar you never had. And I do it a lot out here in the corner of hope when I'm reviewing cigars. I I just posted a review for a, a cigar that we were submitted that new company, never heard of them, never, no backstory, no nothing. Don't, they didn't tell me they, they won't reveal what's in the damn cigar. Like the leaves used. It's fun. It's fun to light it up and spend an hour figuring it out. And even if you don't like it, you're forced to just think about it. And it's, 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 you mix in the other things Tuttle said, the booze and the friends and the conversation and everything. And yeah, man, there's nothing fucking like it. Um, and that's why we keep doing it. Otherwise, you know, it's a lot of work. Why the fuck would we do it? Um, I'm sorry. I just you said you, earlier. You said that. Tell me what this is and why you're giving it to me. And that's a conversation that took place on the last date I went on. I'm sorry. I just <laughs> I, that, was that on the roof of your office with those fucking pigeons? They had all flown the coop by then, literally and figuratively, with <laughs> letters attached to their necks. You, you're responsible for those letters. <laughs> hey, I wore gloves when I typed those out. They, those can't be traced to me. Yeah, speaking of dragons, you mentioned to me you've been reading the comic series Black Dragon from Epic Comics in between your NCIS binge marathons. Tell us about that, not NCIS, the the comic book. So that was a, uh, I found it, uh, came across it, it's uh, made back in uh, 85. It was a six issue run. It was uh, I I got interested in it because it was so Epic was a smaller uh, publishing company that Marvel had a hold of at the time. And they did a lot of actually really good things in that line. Uh, And a lot of those guys that that did stories in the in for that, you know, they went on to do just like some, you know, a lot of the incredible stuff like uh, Epic, uh, you know, started out with uh, 
a guy named Jim Starlin who did uh, he did a character named uh, Dreadstar, which had a run in the early '80s. But Jim Starlin is the guy who went on to write the Infinity Gauntlet. He's the guy that gave us everything that you know all the Marvel movies were about. Yeah. So, but no, the the Black Dragon was just a short, is a quick six issues, but it was written by uh, Chris Claremont who at the time was in his most well-known for uh, his uh, run on uh, X-Men. He did uh, 16 years from like uh, 75 to 91. And so, and, and he's the one that basically changed how or, or what people were doing in comic books. And then from comic books, he's, he's the one that made it, you know, and why so many like uh, TV shows changed too. He made it going from an, an issue by issue, you know, fighting one bad guy every comic book to having a, a overarching story arc, you know, they they had their, you know, two or three issues of fighting a bad guy, but behind it all, there was a whole long and his, and, and the reason that Claremont became so famous for X-Men is because his story arcs would go years. I mean, it would, it would take 30, 40 issues before he, you know, gave you the answer. And yeah. literally, it's like, you know, if you've read comic books, you'll you'll flip through and on that one panel, it'll say, see issue 123. And you're like, wait, oh, this is on bitch. This is issue 357. God damn it. I got to go off. You know? <laughs> and he did that. I mean, is so Black good? Dragon was just a and it, it was just a it was a it was it wasn't really a like a sword and sorcery type thing, but it was about a knight who ends up, you know, having uh is persecuted and because he has visions and which is of course about a calamity of a dragon coming to destroy everything. And so it was just sort of a side project. And of course, I mean, Claremont had gone on and he had written just X-Men wasn't his only thing, but it's what he was most well known for. But this was one of those where he just kind of got to stretch his proverbial wings to do something where he just had a, you know, different, do something different wasn't superheroes it wasn't you know and it was wrapped up in six issues yeah and, and i like the story it's you know it's like i said it's, it's just this knight who's on this who goes on a mission to to try and stop this dragon from bringing calamity was there any dragon herpes no i i, I don't think there was did the dragon speak in an old indian smoker woman's voice in my head yes Okay. Yes, right. exactly. Right. Because it's a great voice for a dragon. Well, that's well, kind of what I was voice. asking about the name of the dragon because you know you 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 know Game of Thrones had like these you know great dragon names and of course you know Lord of the Rings Smaug. What are you talking about? You don't need a fucking name for a dragon. That's not a smoker's Indian voice, but it's yeah, it's not a. It's, well, my my one of my favorite girl. dragon movies, Dragon Slayer. It's like mm-hmm. an Eastern European uh, kind of mentally challenged voice. Oh, I, I thought it sounded like a backup, like a third tier backup character from The Sopranos. What are you talking about? You don't. Hey, hey. 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 Annie, what are you doing here? <laughs> Those are our trash routes, huh? Uh, well, uh, okay. Well, um, well, uh, me personally, boys, to wrap up the fire pit, I've watched a couple of flicks since our last show, and I'm hesitant to even mention them, but there was the 2023 romantic comedy, Anyone But You, starring the usually entertaining Glenn Powell. Uh, he was in the show Screen Queens. He was, uh, in the third Expendables film as the tech guy with the drone, and I yeah. think he was a major player in that new Top Gun movie, Maverick. Yeah. Which I did not see. And his co-star, uh, the very easy to look at Sydney Sweeney. Don't leave out uh Glenn Powell was in uh, the the link later, Everybody Wants Some. Oh yeah, we did Everybody Wants Some. He's one of the baseball mm-hmm. players, college baseball yeah. players that we did that. All I can say on that one uh is that it was like I was watching a movie made by people that had not only never made a movie before, but it was this, they never actually watched a movie before. Uh, it wasn't romantic. It wasn't funny. 
Everything in it was preposterous. It just sucked in every way, shape, or form. 30 minutes in, I was wishing all the characters contracted pigeon herpes and died. Uh, but then they'd have to change the name to anything but that. And it still uh, wouldn't be grounded in any type of reality. It was terrible. So I'm not going to waste your time on that one. You folks at home, skip it. It's just awful. And the next uh, thing I watched was the newly released comedy comedy, not a romantic comedy, a comedy comedy, Ricky Stenicki on Amazon Prime starring John Cena, Zac Efron, and always uh, in- the posters, yeah. And always enjoyable William H. Macy and some other people. It was directed by Peter Fairley, one of the legendary Fairley brothers. Doctor, you mentioned Kingpin earlier. Something about Mary, Dumb and Dumber. Oh, my God. Um, and while it had its laugh out loud moments for sure, I mean, some really funny laugh out loud moments, almost all courtesy of John Cena, who continues to impress me in everything I see him in. You know what? I am afraid of Conor McGregor. I'm not afraid of The Rock. As far as talent coming, cinematic talent coming out of the WWE, John Cena is it. He is the gold standard. He has has done more diverse projects and killed it in comedies and action and everything. John Cena is, I think it's underrated sky's the limit with this dude. I, I, he's very popular. I don't think he's underrated. Everybody loves him, but yeah, but I don't think they love John Cena movies. Oh, perhaps, but he's really, really funny in this. Not like, Oh, it's a big giant freakish muscular dude. No, he's just he has a natural talent for comedy. Um, I will enter you. Shut up, or I. <laughs> but I gotta say this: it was severely crippled. This movie, Ricky Stenicky, by the fact that the three main characters, the three main dudes in it, that were supposed to sympathize and root for, were all major assholes. Like, they weren't just sort of unlikable. They were all total pricks. It was like I was watching a movie about you three guys. Oh. <laughs> mm. Thanks. Oh, wait. That was... Oh, no, no, no. I wasn't supposed that... to say that. I, I wasn't supposed to say that out loud. Pretend like you didn't hear it. I, we did hear it. I think you're hearing... No, going... no. The thing is, I'm going to give you the synopsis in 10 seconds. Growing up. Every time something I was late for something or I didn't make I didn't get somewhere that I was supposed to be with my girlfriend, I blamed Yak Boy, this guy with the glasses on in the in the in the four square. Oh babe, Yak Boy came over or, or babe, Yak Boy had to do my whole life has been blaming Yak Boy for stuff that wasn't his fault. The premise of this movie is these three dudes since high school have blamed or no, I'm sorry, since elementary school have blamed everything they've ever done on their life on this Ricky Stenicki imaginary character. And they continue to use that as adults. They sneak away from their wives, like pregnant wives who are about to give birth. They go to Atlantic city to a concert and they're like, Ricky Stenicki has cancer. He needs us there in the hospital. Might be his last night. They're just pricks. They're just total selfish self-absorbed dicks and you don't want them to like have a happy ending you don't like these guys and it's partially the performer's fault because they 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 just come across as complete but it's also the writing the directing it's you can't have a movie like this where you're not rooting for your main dudes and the only one that comes out of this thing unscathed is is cena as Ricky, they they hire this Atlantic City uh, stage performer to because they have to save their ass at a certain point and present Ricky Stenicki to their their wives because their wives are getting a little suspicious. He's so good, but that's all that's good about the movie. And William H Macy is pretty damn funny too. Yax, did you know or at least have any suspicion that every time Cade got in hot water with his wife, uh, all the way back to high school, that whenever something happened, like he showed up drunk or was hung over or missed, did you know that you were blamed for it? Yes. Yes, I, oh. I did know. 
Yet she, yet she still really likes Yak. Boy. I was about to say the amazing thing is that Yak is so likable. Everybody's like, "Oh, okay." Well, that's why he was an easy, an easy uh, thing to stick the 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 tracking beacon on and 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 use him in that way because she's gonna like you know it's Cody, she's, it's Yak Boy. She's gonna she's gonna be okay. So yeah, I, 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 I mean, just literally, just getting hit left and right. Grenade, I would de- couple I would, of arrows. It's fine. <laughs> Completely I would def- I would definitely say if you're if you're sitting around drinking a couple beers, here's my review. If you're sitting around drinking a couple beers and you want some really good uh jizz jokes, watch Ricky Stenicky because it'll give it to you. It, it's got classic Fairly Brothers just potty humor and 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 dick humor, but don't expect it to be something about Mary or Kingpin level Fairly Brothers. It's it's not that. Um but yeah, so that's that's kind of what I've been up to. Um, so let me say this. Well, I went into both of those films, that horrible rom-com and Ricky Stenicki, with an open mind, as I always, no matter what I watch, I always try to take a breath and give it a, a, a just a clean watch, regardless of the talent involved and the, and the genre. After watching the trailer for tonight's movie we're about to talk about, which I rarely do. I rarely watch the trailer, but I couldn't resist the temptation a few months ago. It was really hard to keep an open mind, but I did my best tonight. Unlike the filmmakers and everyone involved in 2024's Roadhouse. I did my best. They did not do theirs. I wouldn't do it with an open mind. I I, I think we, we kind of talked about that just in general, how in the past when we were younger, as remakes became more prevalent, which they've always been there. That's always been part of, of Hollywood. They, they remake movies um, that, that I, I we, we talked about with Halloween with Rob Zombie and, and Indiana Jones, which you mentioned earlier. Uh I never really took that whole "you pissed on my childhood by ruining something" kind of kind of thing. So I, I I always I got to a point I developed an attitude that was so cynical that it bordered on hipsterism at some point where I just thought that uh, any big budget new movie I'm just not going to like it. They just all suck. And and what happened is that sort of that attitude I didn't. I didn't abandon it. It sort of transmogrified into having no expectations. And that's a good thing. Like no good expectations, no bad expectations. I just have nothing, no expectations. And yeah. it's a fair way. I think that's a fair way to see any movie. And I, I feel like I went into the roadhouse with that. I I, I uh, did I did, I did not. I'll just I'll just go ahead and say it that the trailer was trash. I mean, there's nothing redeemable about the trailer. It was horrible. In fact, I, I pitched tonight's show as, you know, I've, I I think I, I was drunk. So let me see if I got this right. Paid was like, I'm not doing that. And I was like, no, let's just do the show and then just trash on it. It yeah. deserves to be trashed on. Uh, when I watched that trailer, I was just like, there, there's nothing redeemable about this. It is horrible garbage. Yeah, and you're that's right. how I and that's how I went into it. Interesting, Tut, because uh, I watched the two minute trailer and I tell myself you have to reserve judgment because you're just seeing two minutes. Now, granted, the trailer they want to give you the hook. So they want to give you the best things about it. It should, and, it should and, entice you, but I I didn't I. I just thought I, I I kind of just went with, well, I'm not going to have expectations. Hey, real quick, before we get into 2024's The Roadhouse. Oh, because it's going to be good. Um, We didn't talk price point of cigar. You want to take a guess to it? Man, it's, a slow, no it's a slow, I'm... it's a slow burning cigar, man. I'm still smoking it. And I started it forever ago. Man, I don't know. I, I don't even remember what the what the original M80 is priced at. Uh, but I, I'd, I'd go. I want to say thirteen fifty, but I that's my go to for any pri- any cigar that I don't really know. Uh, but <laughs> I like that you. Admit yeah, that. 
<laughs> just got thirteen fifty in my back pocket. If I can't think anything, yeah. that's what I throw out. Uh, six six by fifty two Toro Yak Boy. What's your guess? Go thirteen fifty, man. <laughs> go thirteen. Go thirteen fifty one. All right, I'm gonna go thirteen fifty one. I'm gonna go. Let's see. You can't go over, right? I'm Correct. gonna go. It's ten, wait, wait. It's 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 nineteen eighty four. Ten fifty. Oh. 50 is a great price point for that cigar. Hold on, that, that was my guess. Let me check my note. Oh, uh, I did it again. 1050. That's a great price point for that cigar. It really is. Yeah, it's a great price point for that cigar. I'm I I'm digging it. I uh I never got your marshmallow, but I certainly got a little graham kind of cookie uh on the on the finish. Uh the cedar leather was highly enjoyable. The uh, the pepper with the little salty and must on the back end, yeah, it's great, great construction. Uh, only had to relight once because I was yapping my jaws too much, but uh, yeah, yeah, I didn't have to babysit it at all. It was thumbs great. up, thumbs up on the uh, shade of black. All right, well, let's get down to brass tax boys. Yeah, 2024's Roadhouse. The movie was written by some people that don't have a goddamn clue about writing screenplays. And directed by a guy named Doug Lyman, who should absolutely know better, as he's directed some actual real films and television over the years, such as Swingers, introducing Vince Vaughn to the world, Go, introducing Timothy Oliphant to the world, The Born Identity. Dude, he was executive producer and directed Doctor, one of our favorite series of the early, the O.C., Mr. and Mrs. Smith, starring Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. Jumper, starring Bruce Willis. Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise. This guy's made some stuff. Begging the question, how much directing did he actually do? Well, for the first time in almost 10 years of doing this podcast, 165 episodes, I did not watch our featured film twice in order to take proper notes to help us navigate our way through the story and provide some structure for our legendary analytical discussion. And it's not because I was, it's not because I was lazy. It's not because I got drunk or ran out of time or because I was busy consoling Tud over his outbreak of dragon herpes. It's because I just couldn't bring myself to sit down for another two plus hours and give this piece of shit any more of my time. And keep in mind, I watched that goddamn John Travolta Gotti movie at least twice and that Bruce Willis space movie at least two or three times for this show. That should tell you something. I go, I go hard and I go. All right. all I, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm going to go even with Gotti. I mean, you had Travolta giving you something. It might not have been a good something, but. Travolta, no matter what he does, gives you his all, and you got to respect Travolta. It's okay to watch that more than once to, to see Travolta and what he's trying to do. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody was trying, and I respected that, and I watched it again. Nobody was trying. Yeah, but, all right. Nobody was trying in this fucking movie. I disagree. I disagree. You'll get, you'll get, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. So what you're about, what we're about to take you through is my just two weeks later kind of I'm gonna I'm gonna get you through it the best I can remembering it. And there's it, I guarantee you it'll give you ample time for all you boys to jump in with whatever you want to. Just uh fair enough. I'll just say uh structurally, um feel free to lean on me because I watched it last night. So, um, okay, and as it's fresh as uh, real life events, morality and the human race continues to disintegrate. I've, I've grown more philosophical. Uh, so I, I think that everything I'm going to say, I'll, I'm probably going to repeat this phrase. Everything I'm going to say 
positive or negative, is within the contextual vacuum of this film. It is within this context and without out not comparing anything else. So gotcha. just no, because but, I watched it last night, feel free to lean on me. And, and I appreciate you being but philosophical I'm, because you know what? I'm, Dalton in the original film was philosophical and that well, is... major at NYU. That, that's, that's, that's certainly missing from the the new Dalton. Um, but how I, can you how can you separate it from the project, it's literally Roadhouse. You have to compare it to the original Roadhouse. Oh, you know, you that's do. Why, oh, it's, that's it's, why it, I, No, you do. And that's what, that's, that's. To an extent, to an the, extent the, you do. The, the interesting thing, to I think with. My neighbors are listening to me screaming and they're going, God, they're at it again. Well, hold on, because this, this doesn't get into anything, Kay, that you're about to go into. No, this it doesn't. A general point, a general point. If you watch this film without there being a original Roadhouse, it wouldn't have a fucking leg to stand on as a film on its own. And, and just as a general <sighs> point, without having to do with Roadhouse at all, as as a we talked about this a little bit earlier with some other stuff, as a general point with films, you would not compare a movie from 1989, which is when Roadhouse was released. To a movie 35 years earlier from 1954, it, a little bit, sure, you would say, but you would you would appreciate the fact that this is a totally different time frame. Writers were trained differently. Directors were trained differently. Actors were trained differently. It's an entirely different time frame. So, yes, it's a remake of, of a film. So you're going to have a basic comparison. But at the same point, there is a 35-year difference there. So, uh you still, I think, have to look at that film. Like I said, I'm going to use that over again within its own context. So, but sure, I'll, but I'll... there's a lot. There's a lot of those '80s films. Like when I was first aware that a lot of the movies actually had movies that were in the '50s, and then I watched that. You could still see the connection, the heart, the intent within those things. And I'm not sure that you can see that connection here. What I, what I want to say, and then and then Cade needs to needs to uh, we, we need to let our showrunner uh, do do his do his his part. It's a free run. for all. I'm like what Conor I, McGregor. I'm bringing is, the chaos. I gotta run. I gotta run the show. I just want to say is again. I think, and I think Cade and I are probably in agreement on this. And it's getting the little spidey sense going off. That just taking this movie again, or to use it three times, just taking this movie within its own context, yeah. you don't need to go to any comparison thing negatively or positively if you can. It's just what as its own standalone in a vacuum film, you can you can judge it on those on that as that. It can, and I and I, I I will I did my best watching it to do that. Uh, I will reference the the original film, uh, somewhat in my in in our discussion, but that time frame that thirty something years gap that you mentioned, Doctor, it it I hadn't thought about that. When you look at John Carpenter's The Thing in relation to the it's a remake of Howard Hawks remake. the thing from another planet right. i get that title right yeah which was about 30 years maybe about the same gap yeah in the 1950s and you took you took a movie and 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 you expanded on it you you ex used the modern tools you had available to make it better in every single fucking way you're like man i bet hawks wish he had a rob botine as a special effects guy i wish he had kurt russell as 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 you know a, a dependable trustworthy lead actor i bet he would i've got these things and i'm going to show my cinematic idol who's dead by then obviously but uh, I'm going to show him, you know, I'm going to take this movie I loved and transform it into something that modern audiences can. And now, granted, they hated it at the time. It was the year of E.T. 
They like cute, cuddly aliens. They didn't like fucking spider legs coming out of human heads and dogs with fucking worms coming out of their stomachs. Over time, though, he was right. It's a classic now. But let me get started and let's see how this goes. Um, the I'm going to use quotes here. Movie starts off at an underground unsanctioned fight club where musician Post Malone is the undefeated champion brawler. But when he sees Dalton walk through the door, originally played by Patrick Swayze, now played by Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, he, when Gyllenhaal takes his shirt off, Post Malone quickly forfeits the fight and runs away scared. Only Dalton wasn't planning on fighting at all. He's such a notorious badass that he only has to show up, flex his abs, and his opponents then refuse to fight him, which results in him taking home the prize purse without breaking a sweat. Question. Why cast Post Malone, a very popular celebrity, to play this role when any rift ripped tough looking tattoo dude would suffice just fine who fucking knows as it results in the audience immediately checking out i think like i did a few minutes into the story being told it's just the first of hundreds maybe thousands of dumb decisions on display here hey I want to remake The Shining, but instead of those two creepy little girl ghost twins in the hallway, I want to cast the fat boys. And they're going to be standing in that hallway when the little kid rides his, rides his big wheel down there. Yeah. I, I got to tell you, I kind of like that. Uh, uh, <laughs> hey, somebody, somebody, a producer or someone would be like, Cade, that's going to take people out of the film and it's not good for the story. So maybe... I love it. Maybe casting one of the top five music celebrities in the world as a pit fighter, who, by the way, doesn't have an ounce of muscle on his. He's just he's got a pot belly and he's yeah. just. Why? 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 I know. Doctor, you know. Yeah. It's it's we talked about this earlier with the, it's a it's a marketing hook. It's not Are you sinister. saying that it was a collab. No, it's <laughs> like Headfield and the cigars. I thought there's a book you need to read called If Then, written by a Harvard professor, Jill Lepore, or Lepore, however you pronounce her name. It's basically about how a company, Simulmatics, invented the times that we live in today. So, and how every presidential campaign since Adley Stevenson's in 1952 has been run by an ad agency. It's true. It's not cynicism or any. Oh, any I, I, the scenes. as a dude, I. As a marketing student, I I, I understand yeah, this. Start what? your movie, and it's like, oh, Post Malone's afraid to fight this guy. Of course he is. He's he's not a fighter. He's a musician. I'm just going to say this. For some reason, Post Malone worked for me. I thought it was funny. There was no, yeah, no, he there's no ounce on him, but there is something zany about it that I just fucking liked. And I'm sorry, but when he was throwing punches, he looked like he could throw a punch. Someone trained him the fight choreography. And I'm sorry, I don't care what y'all say about this movie. You, you want to sit there and say, you know, it's a total bunch of garbage, and you can't because whoever the fight choreography is put their fucking heart into it, and it showed on some of these fight sequences. This is some of some really cool, crazy fight sequences going out there. Even though it's fight a uh, fighting style I don't like. I don't. I, I understand that it's the whole UFC theme throughout the entire movie. I much rather prefer the Aikido to the original one. But I'm sorry, the fight scene and the fight choreography on this was top notch, and I don't know why, but Post Malone just made me giggle, and I liked it. To backtrack to Cade's ah. initial question of why, the answer goes back to the book I read, If Then. If we put Post Malone in it, and if we put Conor McGregor in it, then we will get more viewers from the younger generation. It's but I don't even know. I don't, did the only did, there was did no, they even market it as Post Malone in there? No, and they didn't have to because it, right from this scene, there was literally no context because we only have the context from later here when the, the lady who owns, quote-unquote, the roadhouse, she was looking for a tough guy to 
to beat crack some skulls to clean up the town or whatever. She's the only context we have for Malone's character of he's a badass. Well, all I saw was like some two dudes hitting at each other that didn't look like any sort of fighting. Okay. <laughs> they just looked like two guys with their fists wrapped, just wailing on each other. In other words, you say it's choreographed, but I mean, I could have gotten two hobos to do that. Uh, that yes. People have gotten hobos to do that and put it on YouTube. But, but Tut loves the choreography. We're, we're going to have to let Cade continue or we're going to be talking about this movie till four in the morning and I just can't do that. Hey, we're only in the first two minutes and there's yeah. two hours. Oh, You see, boys, it's revealed in flashbacks that as a UFC fighter, Dalton pummeled his best friend in the ring until he killed the guy. Why? We never find out. Other than he kind of mentions to someone when he gets in the zone, he just can't stop. Or something like that. We never learn who the friend was. What's Dalton been doing since? Nothing. This entire movie, we never learn a single goddamn substantial thing about Dalton. And when your lead actor is as charismatic as a fig pizza, that's a real problem. That One, is a real I like fig thing. pizzas. And two, we never knew the backstory of the original Dalton. Oh, you sure oh. as fuck. You sure as fuck did know the original Dalton. You knew something. Thing happened. You knew that this guy lived his whole life as a fucking bouncer, just like his buddy Wade Garrett. They lived in that world. You knew, you knew so much about. He's a bouncer that had something bad happen. Look, there are some things in life that I'll never understand. Things that I'll never be able to grasp or comprehend, no matter how hard I try. Geometry, the popularity of that Big Bang Theory TV show. Weed ales, so. weed ales, and yeah. how the fuck Jake Gyllenhaal became a movie star, and this movie, Darko. this movie solidified it. This guy, if you're gonna have a movie where you don't tell us anything about the lead character and it's all innuendo and just not even innuendo, it's nothing. We're giving we're giving nothing about this dude. He's not the guy. He has no charm. He has no charisma. He has no humor. He has no angst. And despite the fact that despite the fact that the script is so bad that I think I made the analogy and I've made I have several for this movie that now that the baseball season has started Every actor in this movie is coming up to the plate with two strikes on him. Uh, I mean, that, that, the, and, and you have to take that into account. He does get, out of every person in this movie, he's the lead actor. He gets the most opportunity to do something. Uh, and he's not going to overcome the script. The script is atrocious. But he is, he gives you nothing. And I think... I the other analogy I had real quick was it reminded me of an anecdote from the 1962 film Mutiny on the Bounty with Marlon Brando and Richard Harris, where Richard Harris uh, said that you know at that point Brando had become megalomaniacal and was a dickhead and wouldn't even read lines with Richard Harris, and so when he had to do his scenes. Rather than being able to read lines, you know, Brando's off camera and it's on Harris, rather than be able to read his lines with Brando, he read his lines with a piece of driftwood that they found on the beach. That's what he looked at while he did his lines. Jake Gyllenhaal is a piece of driftwood in this movie. He gives you nothing. There is, he has, it's a bad script and no one's going to overcome how bad the writing was in this movie. And you, you do have to give a little bit of an excuse for everybody because how bad the screenplay is. But he is a piece of driftwood. He gives you nothing. It is awful. I am in total agreement with Kate. I don't understand his career. If I've missed some film that I need to go see, not Donnie Darko, Tut. I saw that. He was a young guy. He was like 20 years old. If there's no, something I... in the last 10 years that I've missed, let me know. He is he is driftwood. He is nothing. He gives you nothing. Actually, Dr. I in in my little uh 
where I, I have this little group of trees in my front yard. We have a piece of driftwood out in there, and it That's actually far. it actually has more charisma and charm than Jay Gyllenhaal. That has a little personality. Yeah, he's got no personality. He's got nothing. No, and he has every opportunity. He has opportunities, even with this bad script, to show some charm, to show some humor. To to the whole, where is there a hospital nearby? That whole god awful scene. The writing is bad. The writing is piss. But he he has scenes where he could give you something, and he gives you nothing. Less than nothing. Cody, would you like to pile on? He just has this dumb. Yes, I, I would this, like to you know, pile on. For a guy that's suffering trauma of killing his best friend, he just kind of has this little doofus grin on his face the whole time and I mean, he, he kind of comes across I'm sorry as kind of special not in a good way yes that's exactly where I was going to go he feels like he's dissociative in his own world he's just people come up and offer him stuff okay I'll do that he's just what are you I doing? Agree with that. He's just, hanging, he's just, unlike Dalton, he's just the original Dalton. He's just hanging around. Doodling, just kicking. He's just kicking. You know, he's just kicking it. He's fine. You know, he's fine. He doesn't All seem right. sad. He doesn't seem so happy. He, he's he, just kind of. I, I, I want y'all to get all of this out. How right. do you overcome your lead actor being Driftwood? I mean, yeah. Eddie, well, well, let me let me go a little bit further. Let me go a little bit further than this, and we'll give Todd a uh, maybe. Well, as I go through the story, he'll be like, "That's when it clicked for no, me." No, I, I know, well, no, because it, it's there's you know, not as it, anything in the movie. Go ahead, yeah. Well, okay, you know, as we go past the beginning and as we progress in, it really dawned on me where, obviously, yes, a. A, a good amount of time has passed between the original and this. And yes, as we have, you know, stated there, there were has remakes have always gone on all that, but to literally take away from your character, your central character, i.e. that you know, I and you know we we know from the original that they they followed the the old west trope of the quote unquote kind of you know the the man with no name the drifter the so on and and that's what we were getting, i.e. he's a he's a single name he's Dalton, not Shane but Dalton is Dalton, and all the other stuff and sure they they give you some snippets about him we we hear some whispers and oh, no no no. That's generous. All right. So he so, killed he killed his best friend in the ring. He can't explain why. All right. Well, he first gets of all, in the zone. I, I'm, and just that's about, I'm just talking about. I'm just. I'm just talking fucking... about Jill and Hall, the actor here. Uh, you can't excuse the script. The script is unpassable in any shape or form. It is. I I, I just. It's almost like they paid the script writer fifteen bucks and they got a fifteen dollar script. I mean, it's just the the script is horrible, and that's not to excuse. As, that's not as a crutch or an excuse for for anything that I'm about to say. First of all, Jillian Hall is no Swayze, and I mean, I, I don't know whether Jillian Hall can carry an entire feature film as he's asked to do in this. But I will say this, there is an odd energy to Gyllenhaal or Gyllenhaal. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. In there this is a weird, there is a weird in every movie. No, 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 no. Let's, let's get back to the context in this movie. There is an odd energy to him. In the roadhouse, you see an you see an, an odd and odd, if you want to call it odd, you see an odd energy to Jill in all this movie. There is an odd energy. It I is need some weird. More proper twelve, goddamn it! It's hard. It's hard to explain. It's he's not. 
charismatic as your leading man. He's it's possible not, to explain. It you, is, ever, you ever watch Trailer Park Boys? Do you know who Bubbles is? I'm just saying there is. Okay. He has charisma. I'm Bubbles, just saying that there's Bubbles has charisma. charisma. Bubbles you is special with charisma. Gyllenhaal is just a blank slate of nothingness. I disagree. I disagree. There is this thing there with Gyllenhaal, Gyllenhaal. Okay. I, I, it's hard to explain, but there, yeah, there is this it's energy under- into there. Yeah, and, okay. like, and I it, will say this, you know, was, you sit was, there and talk about driftwood. A driftwood is not going to shred down to one percent body fat. Oh, dude, you're I, just now. You now you could just cast any fashion model in the role, and you're like, "Hey, those abs." That is no, not. You can't because there has been so many films that we have done already, on this podcast dude, he, where the actors do not give a fucking shit. He whatsoever already about had the project. those. Dude, and he, I guarantee you, Gyllenhaal he, gave a shit about this. He project. already had those fucking abs. He was in a boxer movie a few years ago and was shredded. It's not like he his, his he physical tripped. shape. His physical shape has nothing to do with his performance. <clears throat> I'm just saying that. No, I think I think there is. Like when Stallone fattened up for Copland, everybody was writing about it. I'm just saying that. <laughs> I, I'm just saying that it is. To sit there and say that Gyllenhaal didn't give a crap, he was just taking a check. It the was fact just, that you, know, you would trash and worthless. The fact that you would reference that piece. The fact that you would reference that fucking pandering piece of shit Copland, which was only that pandering talk- piece of shit made headlines. It was fucking written it about. Only I didn't it say he didn't give a shit. It only the only reason people talk about Copland is because Stallone got fat. Stallone ate some donuts, that's and that's right. why we talk about that movie. And I, I, I didn't say Jake Gyllenhaal didn't give a shit. I didn't say he didn't care, and that's why he's bad. I'm saying he's just bad. I'm not saying he was like, oh, no, hold I, on. no, I, I, I'm not saying he didn't try. I'm no. saying he's it, not, it, he's is, not a good actor, and he tried and it failed. I'm just saying there's an odd energy, and if you can fucking <laughs> capture it, the dude is, the dude works. Okay, not in, not well, in this film. That may be, but it's not here. The Did director, you say oh, not I'm writer, I'm none of these guys. That, but I'm gonna, I'm Cut. gonna die on the Cut. hill. Where- Cut. Did you just say he has a weird energy that works not in this film, but it works? Yeah. yeah. So it, you just said it doesn't work in this film. <laughs> See, okay, for the fifth time, the context is this movie. Tell, I'm just, I'm just not. I have been listening to y'all say that he is uncharismatic and he's driftwood, and I'm going to defend. So you Gil liked Hall. him, you liked him in Brokeback Mountain, but it didn't. I've never seen that movie. Yeah, sure you haven't. Okay, I, I, am, I, haven't. I am. When I when I call him driftwood, I am talking about Roadhouse. I I don't even think I've seen him in. If he is in another movie. In the last 10 years, that, that someone's going to go, hey, man, you need to see this movie because Jay Gyllenhaal is great in it. I'm going to I'm gonna take your word for that, and I'll go give that a shot. I, am I talking- don't think there's anybody that's ever said that about this, dude. Okay, so I'm talking about this flick here. When I say Jake Gyllenhaal is driftwood, I'm talking about The Roadhouse. I'm talking about the movie for our podcast. I don't – maybe well, he- something else. I wouldn't know. In this, he is a – has no totally devoid of personality and it's a fucking log. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, I would be interested to actually peruse the script simply to see if there was anything before they started doing that would like, is this the way this character is supposed to be? Or is this just what he did? Or is this what the director said? Here's what I want out of you. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he's had so many concussions in UFC, he's got that CTE thing, brain thing, and he just can't really function like a normal human. That would make sense. Yes. I actually think what Yax just said is the $25 million question about this entire movie. Uh, I'm I'm inclined to think that every actor from Jake Driftwood to Conor McGregor to everybody else that's in the movie, I'm going to go out on a limb here, Cade. You uh, you have written screenplays. You have directed a couple of feature films. I'm gonna go out. I dabbled. A, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and just guess. The actors, 
did not write their own scenes. No, they did not. Uh, did not um, write their own lines. So, but that that's the, what, what you actually just alluded to. That to me is the big question there is. If I was directing, if I was directing 2024's Roadhouse, which I would never, for any amount of money, do with the script, it doesn't need to be made. And the first day of shooting, I looked at the dailies and I looked at what Jay Gyllenhaal was doing. I would have tried to to fix it, and I think you know, it's just taking the check. I think it's unfixable. But let me let me. Can I get us into the goddamn movie? Yeah. Enough, oh, I, we're enough, not in the movie yet. I, enough I, about this. Well, I thought we were. I, I just didn't want y'all to sit there shitting all over my boy Jill and all. Look, you we all learned you literally from. you it's literally great. you literally said two minutes ago that he doesn't work in this movie. Fake news. Fake news. I mean, you fake said news. it and we heard it, but okay, that's how America works nowadays. So okay, uh, so a chick. After the the bar fight with Post Malone, offers Dalton five grand a week to come be a bouncer at her small town bar, the Roadhouse. That's the name of the bar, the Roadhouse uh, in Florida. Even though he seemingly, unlike Patrick Swayze's Dalton, has never been a bouncer before and has zero knowledge of the bar industry, you know the very things that resulted in the original film's premise making sense on a basic level. This guy just knows how to smile like a doofus and snap wrists like an in-shape Steven Seagal, which we haven't seen in a while. I'll give him that. Uh, after getting off the bus, Dalton's first stop is at a small independent bookstore. This town has like a convenience store and three three shops. One is a independent bookstore owned by an African-American widower aw, and his wise, sassy teenage daughter. She likes Dalton because he's the only person to ever walk into their store, like ever. I love and her. Daughter, I'm sorry. And her character is super important to 2024's Roadhouse because this Dalton, unlike Swayze, is not wise, worldly, or philosoph philosophical in this in the slightest. So the hack screenwriters thought, "Hey, we need this teenager to have those characteristics." So that Dalton looks smarter by proxy. In other words, just by being around her, this teenage girl occasionally, maybe Dalton won't seem like the vapid total plank that he is. It is the to total fucking perfect example of super cheesy pandering at its worst in a screenwriting. And I resented those screenwriters. So I'm like, oh, you're going to put a teenage African-American poetic teenage girl who likes Dalton to get us to be like, oh, he goes into their store. They like, are you fucking kidding me? Fuck you. Fuck you for trying to make me think that, oh, he's a sensitive soul. He goes into a bookstore. Fucking the original Dalton fucking wrote books in his head that he never published. This dude, he goes into a bookstore. He doesn't even pick up a book. He picked oh. up a pamphlet about a tree. Come on. Yeah, he picked up a pamphlet like, oh, is this something about something? She's like, yeah, it is something about something. Oh, cool. I like stuff about something. Are you kidding me? This is... This is <laughs> that was the, literally the script for the movie. This, so is the, this, this is the worst screenwriting I have in 165 episodes. I have never sat through something written with this low level of respect for the audience. Hey, our main character, he's not very smart. And he's and he boy. Now that we're looking at it, he looks like a total doofus. Hey, what if we have an African-American teenager that runs a small independent bookstore in a town that would never support such a business. And she likes him. And that way we'll think he's smarter. Fuck you. Never yeah. make another movie. You should go to movie jail. A life sentence. Never make another movie. Fuck you. That said, I did like the actress. I did like uh, oh, her delivery. That was fine. Yeah, you know, you know, she, she, you know what? She, no, she no, here's here, here's the thing. Here, here's what I'm gonna say. We're, we're moving on from Jake. I've said what I'm gonna say about the actress playing Frankie ah. and what uh, is the girl? Is her name Charlie? I I, I think that's the bookstore. Doesn't matter. 
uh, I'm going to say this. Them, I give the benefit of the doubt. Their characters were bad. I like nothing about their characters. I like nothing about what they do. They're just bad. But they're not in it a lot. And yep. I will say that that's a situation. Them and his love interest who we haven't introduced yet. But we, we Kate's talked about Frankie who owns the Roadhouse and the Squirrel in the bookstore. On them, I'll go back to my analogy of you came up to the plate and we already said you got two strikes on you. You're an O2 hole. Like, man, that's not fair. You know, it's like, hey, there's some hitters can get Dude. hit with two strikes. Some Dude. can't. This it's is like, a it's like an incomplete grade. We can't pass Dude. you. We can't fail you. Dalton steps off the bus. This is a five building town. They got the roadhouse, a, a hotel, <laughs> a convenience store. Oh, and a quirky little independent bookstore owned by a quirky. That would never happen in no, the you're right. You're right. I agree with you completely. The writings, I, I'm just saying, I'm talking about the two actresses that play the owner of the roadhouse and the teenage girl. I'm, I'm going to say you get a free pass. You you proved nothing. You didn't prove you can act. We, you didn't prove that you can't. We're just going to have to see you in something else. I, I give them no, no, no. I, not good. I like nothing about them. I'm okay. Doc, I give them pass. Doctor, I'm okay with the pass on those two. I'm okay yeah. with the pass. The roadhouse itself is an open bar on the beach where rando troublemakers stroll in daily and just start knocking over people's beer bottles and pushing over chairs because that's a thing. I don't even <laughs> think that's a I don't even think that's a thing in Florida, but it's a thing in in this movie. Uh, a grown man. I'm just gonna snap some pool cues, <laughs> dude. <laughs> there's never more than ten customers in this bar, and once a day, these guys stroll in and just destroy the place. How is she fucking paying one that band that's always behind the cage, and how is she paying Dalton five grand, five grand. a week when she's selling? I don't know, a couple Bud Lights and a couple daiquiris to her that, her regulars. That's a script thing. It's a script thing. Dude, you gotta move on. Dude, she's At like at least in the original. It was our busy. guy fixing up the roadhouse literally did come and say, I came into some money. Yeah. They solved it with the sentence. She could have said the same thing. Dude, it's that's called it, smart writing. The double fixing the, sol- fixing the problem. Did you not notice These that the band can't do that? The band was the Doc and Tuttle experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what was the original bar? The Double Deuce. Double Deuce. Pretty good. It was busy. They were making money. There's never more than ten people in this oh, bar. No, no. It was even as a as a dive. There was still 50, 60 people in there at every single yeah. time. So you're sitting there going, okay, they're making something. He's making something. But he this also was- did imply that he was he wanted to make more money and that he had come into some money, and now he wants to fix it up. Five grand, five, it up first. five grand a week for a dude with no experience bouncing. I want to pay you five grand a week to come in and break my customer's arms. The local cops are bought and paid for. The bar owner chick doesn't know how to look up the phone number for the FBI, which would solve her problems fairly quickly. So Dalton, who doesn't want to fight anymore because of the trauma of killing his best friend, which we barely get into, just starts fighting people happily. And he seems to be having fun while doing it, cracking jokes and always smiling like a freshly turned 21 year old at a titty bar. Hey, speaking of titty bars, which are inarguably uh, awesome, if you were listening to me earlier, you'd know about the newly released tubular-shaped bits of awesomeness that were recently unleashed by our good friends over at Drew State. Dark, bold, and unapologetic. Blackened Cigars M81 by Drew State is an intense journey into the uncharted, deepest, darkest, heaviest depths of Maduro tobacco. A masterpiece collaboration between Metallica's James Hetfield, Sweet Amber Distilling's Rob Dietrich, and Drew State's own Jonathan Drew. The All Maduro Black and Cigars M81 by Drew State is a rich and powerful, but beautifully balanced offering tantalizing notes of leather, chocolate, and espresso that's perfect for both of life's celebrations and time reflection. All right, let me ask you this real quick. 
I got the leather in tonight's shade cigar. Yes. Which is similar to the leather in the uh, original M81. How do you feel as far as tonight's uh, shade to black smoke fitting in with the black end brand of cigars? In my recent written review of the black end M81 over on the TNCC website, I noted a well balanced flavor profile of black pepper spice. This one tones that down a little bit yeah. with the Connecticut wrapper. Uh leather, coffee. I've got I got no coffee coming in this yeah. one. I, I the this coffee one was, is a little more woodsy, a little more cedary, but I got that salty kind of mustiness on the back end of the row, which makes me think that the shade to black it, it is kind of a sister cigar to the M81. Well, yeah, I would I would definitely say that, but I would also say that, you know, in terms of like, I guess, I if you were going to say like, you know, your theme, if you're going with the songs, I mean, like you name a cigar blackened, like the song from Metallica, just like you took this cigar and said, you know, let's uh, fade to black. We'll call it shade to black, but it's. It's still strong. It still has, you know, some 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 good solid flavors in there. But yes, it's I mean Shade to Black was kind of their first ballad. Right. And and this is certainly a softer entry into the black and line. I, I think they do make sense as 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 kind of I mean, you know, in, in Metallica and, and like so many bands at the time, they had such wonderful sort of these kind of low key openings to their songs and then it would ramp up and they would lay in those those first hard riffs but blackened was one of those where it just it ha it didn't really have like something it was just a just a build up to slamming it down fade to black really they felt like they were playing an intro yeah i mean I, I can see the, the I can see the cigar I can see the cigars fitting in the same brand. Um, there's an evil land developer who wants to obtain the roadhouse's uh, property for his new condos or something, and with Dalton and his abs now standing in his way, he's forced to fly in butt ass naked UFC legend Conor McGregor, aka Knox, to escalate both the pressure on the bar and the violence to extreme levels. I, uh, and at this point in the movie, this is when it all for me, for, for me, it made absolute sense. And now I understood the context of where I needed to be. What world was I in? What was the universe that I was in? So to speak. Okay. This is like someone said, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a roadhouse movie. I'm gonna remake Roadhouse. <laughs> Except in this instance, Roadhouse, this Roadhouse now exists in the world of the fast and the furious. Physics makes no sense. Characters make, you know, people's intel, you know, it just it doesn't have, it, it does not it just whew, it goes out there. That's oh, where this part house is. It well, is me... fast in the future. If you saw Vin Diesel and his group drive past this place, it would have made perfect sense to me at this point. Agreed. As soon Agreed. as they brought in, it, or excuse me, as soon as they had introduced the character that McGregor played, the way they introduced him, it all made sense. I'm just like, this, this is it. Well, they if introduce him. If, if people disagree, that's on them. That's the, that's the universe that this movie exists in now. They introduce him where he gets a phone call to come to the Florida and take care of things, and he's butt ass naked walking through this little village in Italy or somewhere, and we see him just with his, his naked butt cheeks, just going around, just tormenting this little town. the The guy's a for, the guy's a force of nature. Uh, criminal nature and I, I want to give doctor real quick because the one thing the doctor said to me off the record not off the record but pre-show 
was that McGregor's performance was the one thing that the one maybe positive thing he took away from the movie. And my, my response to that was, you know, you know, when you've had diarrhea for like two or three days and then you, you sit on the pot and a solid turd comes out and you're like, Oh man, that's good. It is good, but it's still shit. He, he, he's the least terrible thing in a terrible movie, but he's still terrible. It it goes back to, I like that analogy. <laughs> it goes back to the caveat I've been using within this context, which, which means what exactly? It means this horrible script that we've been talking about, the terrible writing, <laughs> the fact that the fact that the lead actor is Driftwood. When you take that in and, and the fact that Conor McGregor did not write his own lines. No, he did not. He probably that, 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 actor either. I'll make I'll make an assumption that uh they probably wrote the the whoever wrote this atrocity probably I'm thinking that they probably had planned to have him in the movie from the get-go. They certainly planned to have a UFC fighter to play that role. I'm thinking they probably wrote it with him in mind. So, and again, at the risk of being accused of afraid of having Conor McGregor coming after me personally, I think he has too many <laughs> bigger things in his life to do. Uh, so the fact that I like his whiskey and, and so forth, uh, I just feel within this context, he gave you something so it's cartoonish it's comical it, it's over it, the top but he where your lead actor has no personality he gave a personality he did give in tut's words he talked about an odd energy he has an energy he has a personality you with, never you never go awesome. full leprechaun i like I never like go. He literally, never someone go, never go full leprechaun. It was as if someone said, "Hey, imagine if you're wearing a leprechaun costume, even when you're butt naked, and you have to walk like that, like Here's you're wearing thing. your clothes." I I, 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 like the, I, I like the axes deal of this. This movie now takes place in the Fast and the Furious. And Con I was against Conor McGregor's. Now I was I was getting ready, or before Yak said that, I would have I would have disputed you, Miss Mincy. But given that this movie now takes place in the Fast and the Furious, he is a perfect character for it. Yeah, but th that's just something Yak said. It doesn't actually exist in the Fast and Furious world. <laughs> in my mind, it does now. I picked the fresh kick spear because I, I had hoped that at least with the new Roadhouse movie, we get some fresh roundhouse kicks. After the movie was over, I said to my wife, I don't think we got one roundhouse kick in this whole damn movie. No, and she's, no roundhouse. And she was like, Roundhouse is the 80s, man. Move and she was on. like, well, I think maybe Conor McGregor did one. And I was like, I don't think so. He was too busy granting everybody three wishes. Dude. It was literally one step away from don't fuck with my pot of gold. <laughs> it was that stereotypical bad Irish shit. It was terrible. <laughs> but I saw promise. <laughs> no, but real quick, so he doesn't kick my ass. It had promise. He showed <laughs> he showed some promise on screen. I hate this it, camera it, because it's showing it, the it, fucking it. veins in my head as I'm laughing so hard. With your with your diarrhea to solid good turd analogy i think you're agreeing with me in that again within this movie's context he actually provides yeah. you with something that the character of Knox, as ridiculous as that character is 
as ridiculous as that character is written, he actually gives you whatever you want to call it. There is an energy. There is a personality to that character as great. Yeah, you know what, you know what that energy is? It's someone saying, Oh shit, I'm on a movie set. I get to be in a movie. Well, I get Dylan Hall didn't do that. <laughs> it is. No, you know, okay. And Jake so we Gilles understand did we not understand. have that energy, but Colin McGregor was very excited to be on a movie set. And guess what? Nobody taught him how to behave or how to act. They just let him go. And he chose to be the leprechaun. Yes. And I, I'm, I'm not, well, here's the thing. Once again. And it was crazy. And once again, like I said, writer, director, there, there's a whole host of people in here. And I was like, if those pe if, if, if those two people didn't come out and say, this is not what we want to see on screen. Yeah. That's not what I wrote. For these characters, nobody stepped up, Yax, and said that because they knew that anything they wrote on the page was way worse than what he was doing, which they didn't think could get worse. Let me just say this there's a love interest uh, uh, with Galen Hall's Dalton with an ER doctor, just like in the original film. Uh, but here it's totally forced, it goes nowhere. Uh, we don't know her, we don't care about her. There, at one point, she like tries to make a move on him. And he's like, oh, is this a date? Dude, Dalton's making sweet love to, was it Laura Dern? Yeah, Kelly Lynch. Kelly, Kelly Lynch. Lynch. Under the moonlight, like he's a Romeo. Gyllenhaal, is this a date or something? Come on, dude. That's the line, though, man. I put Is the this a date or something? Huh? That's the line. I put that character, I believe the character's name was Ellie. Um, attractive young girl, the actress, I put her in the same category, like I said, with Frankie and with the teenage girl. Uh, what hey, I, I, real quick, I'm gonna jump ahead to the end of the movie. I love how this is total 2024 Roadhouse. Hey, you can never be with Dalton, uh, blah blah blah. Okay, she goes. And separate I, way. I she agree was, with I, I agree with what you're saying. Though. She 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 goes her separate way and just ditches him and it. It makes sense in this movie because who would want to be with this fucking vapid asshole? Anyway, there's also a couple of young bouncers that an uninspired Dalton trains that goes fucking nowhere. That was the, one of the best parts of the original Roadhouse was him grooming the young staff of the Double Deuce. Now, just, hey, punch him in the nuts. Oh, okay. There was no, be, like... Be nice. No, there's none of that. There's none of that. Uh, the whole movie takes over two hours to go absolutely fucking nowhere. I'm, yes, I'm, I'm not so... mad. I'm not mad that they made that they remade Roadhouse. I'll always have the original to watch whenever I want to. I'm mad because the people who made this heaping pile of crap clearly weren't fans of the original film and what it did right. And they clearly thought they knew how to do it better. The end result was that they did everything wrong, wasting everyone who pushes the play button's precious time. I'll happily watch High Noon on Makeout Planet. Remember that? Episode 136? Tuesday. I'll watch that 10 more fucking times rather than ever giving this abomination of cinema another ounce of my energy. No, I, the the end. Good riddance. I've never in 10 years of doing this goddamn podcast had this much vitriol. And it's not like, oh, Cade's a disgruntled filmmaker. Can't he can't handle people actually? No. If this is what no, I'm not gonna say that about you. If this if if this is what gets greenlit, I hey man, I'm sleeping good at night. This, this, that romantic comedy, anyone. One but you that I mentioned in the fire pit session. They made a horrible movie, but I never doubted that they that they thought they were making a horrible movie. I don't see how with the caliber. Doug Lyman has directed a bunch of great movies. Oh, get this. He recently said this, a direct quote about his roadhouse. 
The movie is fantastic. Maybe my best. Bullshit. Dude made swingers go. The born identity. The guy didn't give a shit. I'm sorry. He, he and, didn't give and, a shit. And I'm sure it will bring the house down and possibly have the audience dancing in their seats during the end credits. What the which fuck? Leads, which leads me to believe that somebody out in Hollyweird needs to do a wellness check on Doug Lehman ASAP because that dude well, is fucking lost a screw in his head. Well, I'm also curious as to how much he got paid for this because that might be the reason. Probably a lot. Yeah, because I, 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 I think that this, this movie fails majorly in two categories. One is script writing, which is undeniable, and then the second one is in directing. Uh, we can talk about actors and actresses and whatever, but you know, without direction or without a director who gives a fucking shit, and without a screenwriters, I mean, it just it it's it's a horrible project. It really is. Uh, but I, I just, if I, if I were to look at some things, uh, point out two of the major things that I think that this movie failed at, it's those two people can say what they think about Hall. people saying what they think about Connor, you know, whatever it's the director and the script writers who are at blame here. And maybe Wait. the producers, maybe the producers, maybe the producers are like, fuck you and your ideas. This is the thing that we're doing. I'm paying the dollars. Go to go There's to your point no to go to overcome a terrible script. To go to your point, Todd, on uh, you know, Hetfield's collaboration with DE and it's just selling <clears throat> this this thing, thing that we just talked about set an Amazon Prime record the first week of it dropping live, 50 million views. Of course, because it's got Doug, Roadhouse in the title. Doug, Doug, yes. Lyman, Doug Lyman was furious. He boycotted the premiere at South by Southwest because he he claimed he was under the impression that it would have a theatrical release. Everything that was that was released from Amazon and even some of the actors were like, "We always knew this was going to be a Prime movie." Like, but he swears that he was told it would get a theatrical release. Are you fucking kidding? Fifty million people hit the play button on this thing. So you know what? Mission mission accomplished. Yeah. It's Sadness the most watched, amount, it's what it that it's, is. It's the most watched film, uh original film since uh Amazon bought MGM Studio. But it also Speaks to how many people either had fond memories of the original Roadhouse and wanted to see an a remake, an adaptation of, or just something new to the original. It capitalized well, on the people that wanted to see Roadhouse. Well, look. I but also gonna... now, I, and well, and I'll say yes to that. But also say to all the people about MMA, McGregor, so on, and so forth. Post Malone. Post Malone. I'll say this. Wasn't even advertised. Look, the only way we're going to be satisfied is if we recreate this. We go to the pub. Tut, you play that guy with a knife in his boot. Yaks, you grab <sighs> Tut by the leg, twist his fucking leg, drag him outside, and then we're all going to be happy. Uh, and it would have probably been a better project than this. Oh, wait, you guys did that two weeks ago, didn't you? And I'm up here. Yes, we did. And uh, <laughs> my nuts are still swollen. Well, hey, folks. Uh, hey, th man, I can't remember a show that was this heated. Uh, <gasps> I don't know if Tut's just very angsty and uh, and and one to one to go at it, but I, I liked it. Uh, it was fun. And uh, I certainly have no ill will towards Conor McGregor. I want to make that very clear. Uh, Mitz, <laughs> oh, the, neither do I. The doctor, I know I called him a leprechaun a few times, and I apologize for that. And oh, uh, I never well, called you that. He seems like a guy who would appreciate a, a, a sincere apology. Um, but uh, the doctor certainly enjoyed his whiskey. 
I think we all enjoyed our beers tonight. Absolutely. And, and they all so. they all paired really well with the uh, Shade to Black Cigar. So uh, three thumbs up on the cigar. And uh, hopefully you got some beer ideas to go forward with that. Um, yeah, this is fun. I liked it. Talk, give us some links. All right. So first of all, you're going to want to join us on Facebook, Tuesday Night Cigar Club. You're definitely going to want to hit us up on YouTube, Tuesday Night Cigar Club there. You can join us on Instagram at TNCCCast. Uh, but here's the cool thing. If you go over to our website, TuesdayNightCigarClub.com, there's this banner famous smoke shop now you can't get what we smoked on tonight because it's still in development no but it's no it's out there it's on it's live on the famous site you can go oh, to well, famous fuck that up like you a, can go to famous type in script type wrong in, again tuttle <laughs> man you're wrong all <laughs> over the place type in uh the the s80 84 shade to black boxes are are up on the site, ready to sale. Type in promo code TNCC20. $20 off a box. You can't beat that. $20 off a box, and that is definitely yeah. fucking good because with this pro- cigar priced around $10, it's a great fucking deal. Get you $20 off on that. Uh, I Yeah, that's great because I was under the impression that this was still under development because of the white band. No, uh, they are... they they uh, PCA was two weeks ago in Vegas. Mm-hmm. The trade show and they are they've shipped man everyone's got it so uh if you liked the thoughts of white pepper spice with some saltiness and mustiness with a back finish of graham cracker and toasted marshmallow with some cedar and leather on the draw who the hell doesn't want that in their lives you can buy this right now at famoussmokeshop.com to save 20 bucks I'm just going to say, if you're a cigar smoker, just, just go try it. It's it's a really <laughs> interesting cigar. As I predicted, my allergy medicine is now expiring at the stroke of midnight. I'm going to turn into a pumpkin. Uh, but, uh, dude, tonight was fun, guys. Um, I enjoy it. I... Maybe I need to not make show notes moving forward because I felt like that went pretty smooth without it. <laughs> Maybe I've been wasting hours of my life all these years. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, uh, I don't think show notes would have helped to give any coherency to the film. <laughs> Excuse me. Why uh, spend Why spend more effort than the writers of this script did? Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, we've already done that. <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm not kidding. I'm fading. So, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. May the wings of liberty never lose a feather. Let's get out of here. Sayonara, motherfuckers. We'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>For more on O'Brien's Irish Pub, the live music leader in Central Texas, please visit O'Brien'sTemple.com and download their free smartphone app where you'll find full beer listings including over 40 on tap, menu information, and a calendar of upcoming live events. To listen and purchase music heard on tonight's program, check out www.fritzbeermusic.com. Thank you for listening to the Tuesday Night Cigar Club podcast. This is Keith A. Howell saying until next time, friends, unless we see you sooner at the pub. So keep it smoky. And for God's sake, keep it ballsy as well.